Hi, I'm Brad Lee, and I want to congratulate you for continuing to learn about the profession of sales. We are very excited to offer you 52 sales lessons that can help you to polish your sales skills. If you're a person new to the profession, you will find a wealth of information here. I would encourage you to take the techniques or tips covered in each lesson and spend a few days applying it to your specific selling situation. If you have experience under your belt in the world of selling, you will also find some new ideas here to apply to jumpstart your sales and also some reminders of basic sales techniques that you may have dropped along the way. No matter your level of experience, I know that you will find something that will help you close more sales more often. And again, like I said, I'm here today talking with Zig Ziglar about the profession of sales. Zig, you've always championed the idea of salespeople. What do you think the sales profession is such a good choice? The easily, the first answer to that I'll give you is that you have freedom because you have the freedom to be your best self, you have freedom to run your own life, your own business, the freedom to impact the lives of other people. And this is one of the things I want to always emphasize. A salesperson must have the highest integrity of virtually any profession in the world because we are trained to persuade. And an unethical salesman can persuade people to buy something that is overpriced or they've got no business buying or don't need or whatever. But these are the salespeople that come and go. Those with integrity who always look to the best interest of the person they're dealing with are the ones who will build a long-term successful career in the world of sales. And let me ask you this, a lot of the times with the stereotypes out there, why should somebody take pride in being just a salesperson? Well, first of all, let me say there's no such thing as just a salesman. There are salespeople who have really bought into the idea that they can make a difference and make a contribution to the person they're dealing with. You should never sell anything that you do not fervently believe is in the best interest of the prospect you're dealing with. These are short-term salespeople. They will move from one to another to another and never really find the satisfaction. But when you can honestly serve and find a product or a process that will enable them to better their lives, that will fulfill the thing that I've always believed in, namely that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. I've heard that before. Let me ask you this. What would you advise somebody just starting in the profession of sales? Number one, I would say to make certain you do your homework and find out for certain that you're representing a company that is ethical, that they have products or goods or services that will benefit the other person. And then if you can find an individual in that company that you can bond with, and you can share things with, and they're willing to mentor you in some of the aspects of life. And that generally is done through the leadership, the manager, the owner, or whatever. But be careful of whom you, with whom you associate because you pick up their habits. And when you pick up the wrong habits, that's a problem. But when you're following somebody who's dealt ethically with all of his customers, you've got a champion in the making with yourself. Excellent, excellent. Let me ask you this also. If I were starting out in sales, what would be the advice you would give or some of the information that you would provide me that would allow me to create it into a 20, 30, 40 year career as opposed to just, as you said earlier, step by step? Uh, I would emphasize very strongly that you deal with people and products that benefit the other individual. It really is more than a cliche to say that you can have everything in life you want if you'll just help enough other people get what they want. So always deal from the top of the deck. Sell something that you believe in so much that you, in most cases, would buy it yourself. Now, you can't always buy everything you sell. For example, if you're selling uh, caskets, you might not want to buy one until the time comes. Uh, but you should be, have a belief in the product that says, I would invest my money in this for my family because I want them to have the best too. That's the reason I'm with this particular company. Excellent advice. You know, to apply this information today, we want you to write down five benefits that you receive from your career in selling and begin each morning by reviewing and adding to the list. 
You have chosen a career in sales. Take great pride in your choice and continue to learn and refine your skills. Not only is it important for a salesperson to study and master the specific techniques of selling, but it's also important to understand the why of that sales technique. That enables you to internalize the information and then make it your own. I want to share with you in the next two lessons four specific selling principles that will explain the why behind the sales techniques you'll be learning. One of the principles that should guide you in your sales career is this. Selling is a process, not an event. Even if your sales cycle is short, it's not an event based on luck. It's a planned process. You're a professional salesperson, which means you go into all sales calls prepared. You should know your sales process and where you are in that process with each of your prospects. You should also know what needs to be done to move to the next step. By following a road map, if you will, you will know what needs to happen to move the decision forward. Do you have a process that you follow every time? Or do you let your prospect move you toward whatever he wants to and hope that he makes a positive buying decision? To be professional in selling, you need to know what the steps are in the purchasing cycle, and you need to know how to move someone through those steps. You do not leave it up to chance, but you have a procedure that you follow each and every time. This process will obviously need some flexibility, but it's a routine that you practice and master so that you can make every conversation with a prospect count. Selling should involve a relationship between you and your prospect. You need to take the time to get to know the prospect, what he wants and needs, and why he wants and needs those things. Selling is not something you do to someone. It's something you do with someone. As the relationship between prospect and salesperson grows, you learn how you may be able to solve a problem your prospect has with one of your products or services. That brings us to the second principle. Here it comes. You make more money solving problems than you do by selling your products or services. When you only sell products instead of solving problems, you create frustration in short-term customers. But when you listen to the prospect and understand their problem, and then offer a solution to that problem, you become extremely valuable to your prospects. You'll get more referrals and more loyal customers. Anticipating needs or problems sells more products and satisfies more customers. I mean, if customers could solve their own problems, they wouldn't need you. To apply this information today, frame what you sell in terms of solutions, and you'll become an expert in their eyes. In the last lesson, we looked at two underlying principles to the sales techniques you use in the sales process. Today, I would like to share two additional principles with you. I'm going to ask you a series of questions that I would like you to answer for yourself. Number one, do you sell a product or service that is useful? I hope your answer is yes. Do you make a commission for selling that product or service? Hopefully, you are being paid for your efforts. Is your customer still using the product or service and still enjoying the benefits of what you sell? I would guess the answer to that would be yes. Now, here's the last question. Do you still have all the commission you made from selling that product or service? The answer is probably a resounding no. Then who made the better deal? You see, you are doing your customer great service providing them with your benefits of what you sell. However, most of you are thinking about the money you will make from the sale and what you will do with it. But you must remember this. Prospects purchase for their reasons, not yours. Your reason for selling is probably to make a commission, but the customer purchases for their own reasons, not your reasons. Reasons are defined as motives, feelings, and benefits that move people to take action. Reasons are different from benefits. You need to ask questions to discover the reason your prospects may want your product or service. But beware that the first time you probe, you get an answer the person thinks you want to hear. The second time you probe, you will get an answer that someone very near to that person would like to hear. The third time you probe, you may just get the truth. Most people are not trying to be deceitful. They just haven't given much thought to what really is important to them. You see, people purchase for emotional and logical reasons. Your job is to discover both kinds of reasons by asking questions. The second selling principle is this. Prospects don't buy your products and services. They buy what your products and services will do for them. It's true that people have different reasons, as in the last principle, but this principle focuses on the benefits they realize as a result of owning the product. If you sell mattresses, for example, the benefit might be there's room to stretch or it's a good night's sleep. It doesn't matter what you think the benefit for the product is, not your benefits. 
it matters what the prospect thinks the benefits are. So the next time someone asks you, what do you sell, answer in terms of a benefit instead of a product. To apply this information today, concentrate on why your prospects want your products and what benefits they may derive from it. Both of these answers are found by asking prospect questions. I was recently with a group of salespeople and I asked them to tell me what they sold. I made a list on a piece of paper as they told me. On the list I wrote cars, SUVs, minivans, sports cars, and extended warranties. And then I asked them to think about what their prospects are really buying from them. As they reflected, I wrote another list of their answers, and they said things like peace of mind, image, lower maintenance costs, and safety. As I showed them the two lists, it began to dawn on them, like I'm sure it's starting on you, that there was a problem. If I'm selling one thing, but my customers are buying another thing, that's a problem. So, what do you sell? Do you like to tell your customers all about your products and the great features those products have? A professional salesperson will always sell what their prospect is buying. To apply this information today, sit down and think about how you would answer the question, what do you sell? Actually write down on a piece of paper a list of what you would say. Then draw a line down the middle of the paper and ask yourself, what are my customers really buying? Write down those answers. The two lists must match for you to be successful. Remember, Features tell and benefits sell. Think about how you can frame all your features into benefits because that is what the customer really wants. Over the years, salespeople have been given a bad rap of being dishonest and unethical. A truly professional salesperson with their goal on a long-term career in sales realize that honesty and ethical dealings with others is the only way to build a solid career. I hear story after story after story of people who did the right thing and were rewarded for it somewhere down the line. I'm reminded of a sales manager who sent out an inexperienced salesperson. The rookie came back with a $225 check for what should have been $125. The manager, of course, quickly took the rookie back to the customer, explained the mistake, and then offered to give them the service for free. The man gladly accepted the offer and then went on to sign up for a $100 monthly service contract. Now, if the manager had not rectified the first mistake of $225, the customer probably would have done some shopping around and found someone more reasonable to give his $1,200 a year business to. In the long run, it pays to be honest and straightforward with your prospects and customers. Being ethical is not only the right way to live, it's also the most practical way to live. True selling professionals don't only talk about ethics, they live ethically. In this day and age, people are searching for people they can trust. Because it is a cynical time, you understand that most people you deal with for the first time have their guard up and want to make sure that you can be trusted. This is when a sterling reputation can help you out. You can give references of other customers that will attest to your honesty and your honest way of doing business. Or because you have confidence in your product and the knowledge that you conduct your life in a fair and honest nature, you can look that prospect right in the eye and exude the warmth and assurance that you are to be trusted. Now to apply this information today, go to the nearest mirror, take a look at it and say, I am an ethical salesperson. I deal with all people in an honest way. Repeat this affirmation for the next 30 days and you will increase your feelings of integrity and that will be communicated through your words and your actions. However you communicate your trust, know that you will always come out in the long run better by dealing with everyone you come in contact with in an ethical and honest manner. I'm Zig Ziglar. I'm obviously, hopefully, in your mind, a positive thinker. But let me explain something. Unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion about positive thinking. Because you see, some people say, man, with a positive attitude, you can just do anything. And that simply is not true. It won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything better than negative thinking will. Simple example. Shaquille O'Neal is a great athlete. But even with his athleticism, and even if he was a great positive thinker, he still would make a terrible jockey. 
No, I'm talking about positive thinking based on specific reasons for that optimistic hope. It's ridiculous and frustrating for a new salesperson to have his manager say, go get them. I know you can do it. And then send them out with no training or direction. That leads to frustration and failure. The student must be a constant learner. Preparation will develop a positive attitude to go out and succeed. Remember, your business is never good or bad out there. It's either good or bad between your own two ears. There are many examples of salespeople being very successful in what is supposedly a down market or a sluggish industry. Don't listen to the naysayers. Keep your attitude up and your sales will follow. There are three action steps you can take. Number one, accept the fact that only you can control your attitude. Your attitude is not governed by the prospect or the manager who doesn't support you or the economist who predict gloom and doom in your career. You must take control of your own attitude and develop an optimistic sense of success. Action step number two, you commit to do whatever is necessary to keep in control of your attitude, saying positive affirmations, taking a brisk walk around the block, whatever steps work for you to maintain or regain your commitment to taking control. Action step number three, Read something of value to you personally and professionally for at least 20 minutes every day. Something that inspires and educates. These simple steps will help you keep your attitude in the right frame of mind so that you can be free to be a problem solver for your prospects. Research has shown that 63% of all sales interviews end with no direct effort to close the sale. The salesperson is comfortable building rapport, asking questions to find a need, and even presenting the offer. But because of a fear of rejection, they talk and talk and talk, but never ask for the order. Are you a professional salesperson or are you a professional visitor? Those salespeople with a poor attitude about themselves will have to admit that they have a hard time facing up to rejection. After making a rather spectacular presentation, you find yourself out on the street with no order, no signed paperwork, and nothing to show for your efforts. Those with a bad attitude about themselves will have to go to the closest coffee shop and lick their wounds and have a pity party about how cruel the world can be. But those with a healthy attitude will find themselves out on the street after a no, shake it off, and go about finding the next prospect to whom they can make their presentation. There is a direct bearing on a salesperson's self-image and their sales success. Those with a healthy self-image, not conceit and an I'm so great attitude, but a healthy self-acceptance of their own faults and shortcomings and strengths. These salespeople can go from one prospect to the next many times, almost regardless of the reception they get. Now I admit, there is a limit to how much rejection anyone can stand, but you get my point. When you improve your attitude about yourself, in other words, improve your self-image, you will improve your sales performance. To apply this information today, Work on developing or maintaining a healthy attitude about you. There are many ways you can accomplish this task. Here are two action steps you can take. One, dress the part. It is proven that we feel better about ourselves when we are dressed for success. Make sure you are putting your best foot forward by keeping your shoes shined, your hair neat, and your clothes neat. Action step two, is to become an expert in your chosen profession of selling. Learn the sales techniques that work best in your selling situation and practice them until they become a part of you. With improved effectiveness, 
your love for selling will be even greater because an important key to maintaining a good attitude is to know what you are doing. How do you really view the person you're dealing with across the desk, the conference table, or the phone? Is he just another someone you can make a buck by selling to? Or does he represent a person with a problem which you can help solve? Are you really focused on him or on making the sale and spending the commission? In survey after survey around the country, the number one complaint from customers is that of rudeness, inefficiency, or just plain indifference. Two of these have to do with simple human relations. How we feel, our attitude about our prospects and our customers comes out loud and clear in our actions. The Forum Corporation studied high and low performing salespeople. One of their discoveries was that the high performing salespeople took just as much time and effort with their internal customers, those inside their organization, as with their external customers. Most salespeople's success depends upon people to whom they have little or no supervisory control. High performing salespeople understand that respect and a positive attitude towards those in shipping, installation, service and administration will help them please the external customer and possibly lead to more sales or referrals. You see, making a serious effort to keep our customers makes good economic sense. It costs more to bring in a new customer than it does to keep a current customer. It costs more in time, effort, as well as marketing dollars. Also, if that customer leaves disgruntled, he'll tell an average of 11 other people about the problem he had with you and your organization. So a high-performing salesperson does not think in terms of replacing customers. Instead, she thinks in terms of maintaining customers and adding new ones in order to build her business bigger and better. To apply this information today, be sensitive to the value of the customer's time and spend more quality time in front of the customer because you've spent more time planning strategy and preparing for the call. Customers perceive this and value it highly. Become aware of the personal pressures and needs faced by the customers and sell to people, not to companies. Take time to build relationships with both your internal and your external customers. No matter how good you are at building rapport, uncovering needs and wants, asking questions, asking for the order, managing objections, making your presentation or your product knowledge, you're out of business if you don't have a prospect. Prospecting is one of the most important keys to your success. So, when should you be prospecting? Well, the answer is all the time. Prospecting is not an eight to five job. Prospecting when done graciously can be done in virtually any environment, in social situations, on an airplane, in an airport, at lunch, or a club meeting. In general, wherever people are present is an opportunity to prospect. This doesn't necessarily mean you approach everyone at the party, or corner the people on the driving range, or speak to every person at the post office or in line at the fast food place. The successful prospecting attitude does mean, however, that when great prospectors pick up the newspaper, there is a sensitivity to local events or news stories that contain leads or prospects for the business. The successful prospecting attitude means tuning into conversations that would directly or indirectly involve the use of the product or service you offer. Pay attention to the events, trends, conversations, and your current customers. Regularly get out of the networking circles you're in and start another circle or chain. Don't let your career depend on one specific group of individuals. How do you prospect? First, you must develop a genuine interest in other people. Open up a friendly conversation about something you're both experiencing and begin listening to the other person. In the conversation, you may find out that you have a product or service they would need, or at least the chance to get to tell them what you do. In another session, you will discover a way in a quick sentence or two to pick someone's interest. Have you ever had the experience then when you bought a certain car, say a green Buick, and then wherever you looked, you saw green Buicks? It's the same thing with prospecting. If you're thinking about prospects and looking for them wherever you go, you will surely find them. To apply the information today, make it a point to speak to at least two new people that you don't know. Strike up a conversation and see where it leads you. It will take some practice to become comfortable and effective at this, 
but what a great benefit to have a full pipeline of prospects. How to determine your best lead sources. Prospects come from many lead sources. It's important that you know your best lead sources. Some categories include existing customers. Are they willing to buy more or different products from you? Referrals are a great lead source because you go into the process with an introduction from someone else. A warm market is your family, your friends, your colleagues, former customers, people you know personally and have already developed a rapport and trust. A niche market or related industry. This is a business that's your competitor, but it's what you sell into. In other words, you and the salesperson at that business can team up to offer an excellent full service package. Of course, you may be lucky enough to work for a business that has a marketing effort that generates leads for you. At last, there's cold calling. This is done best through your observation of new business openings or newspaper articles or other such current events. But sometimes it's just getting a list of people and starting to dial the phone. Of all these lead sources, which are the ones that work best for you? To apply this information today, on a piece of paper, jot down the six categories I just gave you and estimate the percentage of your prospects that come from each of those lead sources. So for my business, I get about 35% of my prospects through existing customers, 15% through referrals, 5% through what we call a warm market, and 5% through a niche market. 30% through our marketing efforts and 10% through cold calls that I make. By doing this on your own, you can find out your situation and you can see where your prospects are coming from. Now realize that not all of these categories give you qualified prospects. So identify which categories are at the top, those two places that are at the top, you turn prospects into qualified buyers and into customers. In order to grow your business, you must handle your leads or prospects efficiently. The point is to invest time and effort on the prospects that yield you the highest returns. The question is, what is a prospect? I ask the question because there is a difference between a suspect and a prospect. A suspect is a name that could be a prospect, but you don't know yet. A prospect has a need for the product, a possible desire to own that product, and the financial capability to implement that decision. You spend time with suspects, you invest time with prospects. In this session, our goal is to create a profile of your ideal prospect so that you can identify the characteristics and demographics surrounding those that you have already closed and looking for similar entities to do business with. For example, if within your existing customer base, your best customers are in a certain geographic area, you owe it to yourself to explore other opportunities in the same geographic area. The same would hold true if they belong to a trade association. Everyone else in that association would be a warm call for you. Taking the time to find this information is important. What does the ideal prospect look like for you? To create this profile, you begin to think about your current customers. What similarities can you see in them? Do they have the same job title or are they from the same industry? Are the companies all about the same size or location? Don't forget, when you are building the profile of this ideal prospect, you must consider the company as well as yourself. Would this type of customer be the most profitable to the company for you to have a sale? Be a true success, the customer wins, the salesperson wins, and the company must win. You need to make sure you are targeting the customers who give you the best return on your time invested. Once you identify a prospect that fits the profile of a good customer of yours, you must contact that prospect with the intention of asking enough questions so that you can either, one, turn him from a suspect to a prospect, or two, disqualify him as a prospect so you can move on, or three, 
find the real buyer or decision maker or four, sell your products. Remember, a truly qualified prospect meets all these qualifications. They have the authority to buy, the ability to pay, and an unmet need. It's important not to push products on people who are not qualified prospects. It wastes time and damages their trust in you and your company. Rather disqualify the prospect and move on to apply this information today, create a profile of your best customer, and begin to look for prospects that fit this profile. Realizing, of course, that some prospects will buy that don't fit that profile. Use the profile as a sort of magnifying glass to help you zero in on the best people to spend your time with. Even if you think you have the best product or service in the world, there are people out there who couldn't care less. Your job is to eliminate them quickly so you can help the people who do need what you sell. Mary Kay Ash of Mary Kay Cosmetics once remarked concerning the fur coats the company awards to top sellers, every hair on this coat represents a customer who said no. She knew that if you keep eliminating the no's, you have more time for the yeses. When you get the familiar question, what do you do? How do you answer? If you answer with a job description like, oh, I'm in sales for the Peterman Company, then you are not using that opportunity to prospect. What you want is a statement that leaves the listener intrigued and they're prompted to ask you more. These statements are generally called elevator statements because they have to be quick enough and catchy enough to pique someone's interest in the time it takes to ride an elevator. A good statement needs to be short, about a key benefit, and said with sincerity. If you have limited time with someone, it will help you establish credibility quickly and hopefully get the potential prospect interested to hear more. Some examples of elevator statements are, what do you do? I build better businesses by building better individuals. Or, what do you do? We provide the keys to the American dream of owning a home. Or, what do you do? I work with clients who have a passion to increase their business while creating more family time. Each of these examples gives just enough information for the prospect to want to know how or why or what you're talking about. You use elevator statements if you're meeting someone in a quick setting, a chamber of commerce meeting, in an airport, or any place that you get the question, what do you do? To apply this information today, brainstorm some quick, clever statements that describe what you do in terms of a benefit. To do that, ask yourself what you like best about the product, the service, or the company you work for. That's a good place to begin describing your job in terms of what you can do for others. I recently worked with the National Guard recruiters, and one of the recruiters likes to tell people, I help young people attain their dreams. That would certainly get a conversation going that would allow the recruiter to expand on the benefits of college tuition, paid training, and many other benefits of joining the Army National Guard. Create two or three of these elevator statements and practice using them to become comfortable and effective at using every opportunity as a prospecting opportunity. When you want to capture the attention of a prospect, you can use a general benefit statement. Now, this statement is longer than the elevator statement that we discussed earlier in a previous lesson. It's used when you are calling on a list of people in which you want to generate interest in talking to further. It's also when you call and leave a voicemail message. Now, this statement will increase your chances of a successful first contact. It will also give the prospect a reason for meeting or talking with you. In other words, it creates value. The general benefit statement includes three parts your competitive advantage, a sales objective, and a brief information point about the prospect. Your competitive advantage is a benefit that your product or service has over the competition. While you don't know this prospect yet, or if this benefit is specific to the prospect, you do know that it is a general benefit that most prospects are drawn to. So you need to do some thinking, some research, and some comparison to your competition. What does your product or service have that others don't have? Is your warranty better? 
Or does your product save more time, have less maintenance costs? Or does your company provide superior technical follow-up, better service, or cheaper installation? This competitive advantage is a great sentence to leverage yourself into an appointment with that prospect. Once you get to know the prospect situation a little better, you can then target the features and benefits that fit the directly to the prospect. For now, you are just trying to win an opportunity to talk further with the person. Secondly, you want to state clearly to the prospect your objective. It could be many things. For instance, you may be calling to secure an appointment or to introduce a new product or set a follow-up phone call. You need to know why you're calling so the prospect can know why you're calling. And the last part of your statement is to let the prospect know that you've done a little research and you know a little bit about him or her. Give the feeling that you're interested enough to have done some homework. If I were reaching the prospect for the first time, I may say something like this. Hello, Mrs. Barr. My name is Brian Flanagan. I represent Dallas Marketing Concepts. I'm calling because the Hyatt is very similar to another hotel property in Dallas that we've been helping to increase their guest retention. Recently, this client has realized a 37% increase in return customers using our program. Now, since you're the director of guest services at the Hyatt, I assume that you're under constant competitive pressure. Is that right? If there were a way I could help you relieve that pressure, would you be interested in meeting with me? Well, that's great. I think a 20-minute appointment would be a perfect starting point to see if what we offer is something your hotel could use to increase your occupancy. I'm open on Monday or Wednesday. Which would work for you? My competitive advantage is that statement that my company can increase guest retention. The sales call objective was to secure a 20-minute appointment, and the information I knew about the prospect was the name of the hotel, the name of the job, the title, and the person I was contacting. This is a general benefit statement that you can use to create enough interest to gain the prospect's attention. To apply this information today, determine your competitive advantage, create a general benefit statement, and practice saying it several times out loud so that it sounds conversational, natural, and sincere. By using a general benefit statement, you may open the doors for longer conversations with your prospects. Successful sales professionals understand that having prospects to call on is an important part of the selling cycle. This process is called pipeline planning. Having a steady supply of leads based on probability of close ensures the sales professional is managing the future as well as the present. Pipeline planning requires understanding and categorizing your prospects by metrics that are important to you and your business. It would need to include name, primary contact, contact information, probability of close, and type of customer, either new or existing. Take your current prospects and list them on paper. The probability of close can mean you would put an A beside a prospect that you think will close in less than 30 days, a B based on the probability it will close in less than 60 days, and a C based on thinking the close will happen in less than 90 days. You can adjust the timeline to fit your specific situation or selling cycle. This grid, when filled out, will give you an opportunity to look at a projection of your activities and ensure that you have enough qualified leads to work on every single day. There's all kinds of software out there that can keep all pertinent information, or you can do what a successful salesman I knew did. He took an old-fashioned three-by-five card. He wrote his top 20 accounts on it. He would then work those accounts until they either said no or wrote up the order. As soon as one prospect closed and became a customer, he would erase the name and replace it. It was low-tech, but it kept him focused on what he needed to do on any given day. Do you go to work every day with a clear plan of what must be done to close business already in the cycle and activities that need to be done to replace that prospect when you close the sale? If the answer is no, then today, write out your current pipeline on paper or put one into your computer. This is the first step to jump-starting your activity and ultimately your success. When you are under pressure to make your quota, it's easy to concentrate only on the closing end of the sales process. However, you have to continually have new prospects to talk to if you want to continue to make your sales quota. You need to manage your pipeline of prospects so that at all times you have prospects moving through each step of your sales process. If you don't, then you will have dry spells and a certain drop in revenue. Managing this process is called pipeline management. It requires that you not only keep the pipeline full by prospecting, 
but that for each stage of your sales cycle, you identify clearly what activities need to be accomplished for that prospect to turn into a customer. If you are managing your pipeline, then you will have better sales forecasting, and you will daily know what you need to do to keep the revenue up. Too much attention to any step in the sales cycle, for instance, closing activities, will mean not enough attention somewhere else, for instance, prospecting. And there will be a constant need to play catch-up somewhere. That can be draining to your mental as well as your physical health. The trick is to balance your activities between the prospects who are in the beginning stages of the sales cycle and those who are in the closing stages of the sales cycle. It is best to set up some accountability checkpoints. These are regular, scheduled times that you review your pipeline with your manager or yourself. Technology can certainly automate some of this information so that you can quickly look and see what activities need to be accomplished with what prospect and when. CRM, or Customer Relationship Management Software, is easily found, and investing your time in learning the software will pay off as it frees you up to do what you do best, namely, sell. To apply this information today, you need not only to have a form created for your pipeline, and for more information on how to do that, you can check out the Pipeline Planning lesson. However, besides having a form, you need to review it regularly and then plan your daily, weekly, and monthly sales activities with that information. Knowing this information is critical to your success. Sales managers and sales professionals often get caught up in the sales skills trap and try and find the secret or missing ingredient to their sales process. They focus on sales techniques when in fact they should be focused on intent. As Zig says, you can have everything in this life that you want as long as you help enough other people get what they want. The goal of a true selling professional is to help their prospects and customers get what they want and more importantly what they need. The key is to remember that intent is more important than technique. In other words, your desire to help is far more important than knowing 14 different closes. So how do we demonstrate our desire and our intent to help our prospects and customers? Well, for starters, try this. Before launching into your probing and questioning to uncover any need for your product, begin by framing the sales call. After the warm-up or initial small talk and greetings, try something like this. Thank you again for your time today. I really have a very simple agenda for today's meeting. First, I'd like to learn more about you, your role, and some of the projects and initiatives you are currently working on. Secondly, I will share a little about myself and our company and what we do. And lastly, if it's appropriate and makes sense, we can look at action items or next steps. Does that sound fair? More than likely, your prospect or customer will say yes, of course it sounds fair. They may add to the agenda or do a time check, but they will usually agree that it is a fair way to begin the meeting. Now let's analyze the wording. You ask permission to learn more about them, then share a little about you. More them, little you. Then you use the words we, us, and together. When they agree that the agenda sounds fair, they have agreed to allow you to ask questions first and learn more about them. By asking relevant questions and taking the time to understand their business needs, you will have moved from a vendor relationship to more of a partner or consulting relationship. This path will certainly help you demonstrate the intent and desire to help your prospects and customers find the solutions they truly need. To apply this information today, write out the sentence I used to frame the sales call on an index card and review it until you can say it conversationally and comfortably. You will find that people are interested in talking about themselves and their situations, which then gives you the information you need to help solve their problems. Have you ever felt anxious before making a sales call? If you're human, and I hope you are, then the answer is probably yes. The difference between the salesperson struggling to get by and the successful salesperson is the ability to direct that nervous energy. As a matter of fact, if you feel no anxiety in making the sales call, your chances of success will go down. Realizing that your anxiety is a positive factor, not a negative factor, allows you to focus on the most important factor in call reluctance. That's you. According to sales experts, 84% of all salespeople have call reluctance to some degree. This fear is manifested in 1,000 different ways.
but procrastination is the number one indicator that a problem is developing. When you create non-essential tasks that must be done before talking to a prospect, call reluctance is setting in. I want to share with you three ideas to overcome call reluctance. Idea number one, realize that selling is a transference of feeling. If you transfer the feeling that you must make the sale for your benefit, the chances of making the sale are greatly reduced. If you transfer the feeling that you want to make the sale for the prospect's benefit, your chances for success are dramatically increased. Take the focus off of you and your nervousness and mentally put the focus on helping the prospect solve their problem. Idea number two, use the experimental syndrome to overcome feelings of rejection by making each call a positive experiment instead of a negative experience. In your mind, turn each sales call experience instead into an experiment. Here's how the experimental syndrome works. When you approach a prospect, whether by phone or in person, you are to remind yourself that you are conducting an experiment to determine the way the prospect acts towards you. You will keep a chart of all people and all responses. When you approach the prospect, instead of taking the negative reaction as a personal rejection, you simply note on your chart exactly what you observed. This approach causes the prospect's actions to have minimal effect on you. Your concentration and focus are on the experiment, not on the experience. After all, you're a nice, cheerful, friendly, optimistic, helpful person with a beautiful presentation and a tremendous product, the nasty prospect is the one with the problem. Let the prospect keep the problem, and you continue with the experiment. Here's the really exciting part. As you adapt, adopt, and make this procedure your own, your confidence will grow substantially, and you will become much more effective in your approach and presentation. The third idea is to get on a regular schedule and make an appointment with yourself to be face-to-face -face with the prospect at the same time every day. It is important to get on an organized program followed in a disciplined manner, no matter what small obstacles that try to get in your way at the exact same time every day you are face-to-face -face with a prospect. Organization, discipline, and commitment make the consistent high-volume production makes the appointment with yourself, and when the time comes without fail, head for that telephone or that prospect. There is a simple yet profound psychological reason that this works, and it is logic will not change an emotion, but action will. Call reductance is an emotion and they will not be overcome consistently by logic. Get into action, support the action with logic, and sales success is sure to be yours. To apply this information today, pick one of the three ideas and try it out. Or for more information, I developed an entire chapter to this topic in my book, Ziegler on Selling. What is most important to internalize and truly believe is that when someone refuses to let you make your presentation or turn down your offer, they're not rejecting you, they're simply making a business refusal. By grasping the idea that a no is not personal, but business, it puts you in a much better frame of mind to try again with the next person. People, including your prospects and customers, will take from 3 to 30 seconds to make a decision about whether they want to give you their time and attention. 
Once the impression has been made, all the information will be filtered through that initial decision. How can you and your company make a positive first impression and then build on that to establish trust and rapport? Let's first look at your company. When someone is coming to your establishment to do business, what do they see? They begin to form opinions about your business before they talk to a single person. Is the building neat and clean? Is the reception area projecting the right image for your business? Take a look around your physical surroundings through the eyes of a prospect. Is it making the best first impression? Maybe your prospect's first contact with your company is over the phone. Is it answered promptly? Do they have to go through a series of impersonal voicemail options before getting to a live person? Maybe your prospect's first contact is through the mail. Are your company's marketing pieces professional? Are they well-written and well-designed? You may have little or no input into how your company forms an impression for the prospect. So, let's turn our attention onto what you can control, you personally. How do you create a positive first impression? Just as a prospect may make an impression of your business from the outside people will also form an impression of you based on your outside. Are you clean, neat, warm, and friendly? Think about your business card. When you hand it to someone, does it make the right impression? Keep the design simple. Use the front of your card to display your contact information only. Use the back of the card to give your company's mission statement, a map to your office, a list of services you can offer, anything that is helpful to the prospect. In another lesson, you'll learn how to give a short, unique statement about your business to pique a prospect's attention. Think about how you deliver that statement. You need to be sincere and approachable, but beware. As important as first impressions can be, the most current contact a person has had with you or your company will be the freshest thing on their mind. So start strong with a positive first impression, but remain strong with consistent follow-up, attention to service, and a focus on solving the prospect's needs and wants. To apply this information today, Take inventory of all the opportunities you have to contact a prospect. Your physical building, your marketing materials, your business card, and the most important, you, the salesperson. What kind of impression are you making? What can you do to improve the impression you are making? Strive to make the best impression possible as you know people like to buy from people they trust. Make every effort to express your sincere trustworthiness and you will make a positive, lasting impression. Questions allow us to gather information, which enables us to help our clients, and just as important, maybe more important, when we ask questions in a professional manner, we establish the most important aspect of the sales process, trust. When you ask questions in a sincere manner, then you show that you are truly interested in the prospect's best interest. Properly worded questions are the best way to discover the true needs of a prospect or client. Questions demonstrate that the purpose of our call is to find the prospect's needs and interests while gathering information so that together we can learn how my products and services can benefit their needs. Prospects like to be heard in order to have the confidence that you really do understand that their situation is different. In reality, their situation may not be different but reality, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. We can never gain the trust of prospects until they believe we are really interested in solving their unique problems. Now, I'm not suggesting that you ask a series of questions that feels like an interrogation or questions so obvious that you are leading them down a specific path. Instead, what I'm suggesting is that you ask questions that combine both the emotion and the logic. Use thinking and feeling questions, questions phrased with, how do you feel about will help you learn how the customer feels and then you are far more likely to find out what that person thinks. 
You want to combine both emotion and logic. Emotion makes the prospect take action now, and logic enables them to justify the purchase later on. Be sure to ask more open-ended questions than closed-ended questions. Open-ended questions are those most valuable types of questions that you can ask because they allow the prospect to give you the most information about themselves and their issues. They begin with words like what, how, why, when, or tell me more about that. Now, closed-ended questions can be answered with a simple yes or no. Use them to gather facts. They should be used infrequently during the sales process. You can also ask reflective questions. They give you a chance to reflect on a previous comment and give the prospect a chance to elaborate on clarity. A question that begins with, what do you mean by, or how is that impacting your business? These are examples of follow-up questions to the prospect's previous answer. You will also want to occasionally use a direct agreement question. Now, these are yes-no type answered questions, but you know the answer before you ask them. For example, this will save you time, won't it? This gets the prospect into agreeing mode, and the agreeing mode helps you sell later on. To apply this information today, write down sample questions you could use with your next prospect or customer. Then work some of those questions into your conversations to see how they can work for you. You can benefit from being curious and asking more questions, can't you? It's not enough to successfully ask your prospect questions to gain information about what their needs and wants are. You must also tune in and listen to what they're saying. I've never heard of anyone missing a sale because of listening to the prospect's needs, wants, and desires. Interestingly enough, the more you know about the prospect needs, the better position you're in to meet those needs. Not only that, but the trust factor goes up. When the prospect sees you listening intensely to their needs and desires, they have a better chance of trusting you right off the bat. Listening is not easy, especially if you're enthusiastic about your offering and want the prospect to hear all the good things you have to say about your product. But listening is a must if you want to succeed in sales. Listening is a mental discipline. You must control your desire to use the time when the prospect is talking as time to prepare what you're going to say next. While someone else is talking, that is not the time to let your mind wander to your next appointment or other tasks scheduled for the day. Listening is also a physical discipline. There are certain things you can do to tell your mind to listen up. Looking the other person in the eye, leaning slightly forward, nodding your head. These are all ways to get your mind set to listen. When you listen, you do more than listen with your ears. Listen also with your eyes. In other words, watch for those nonverbal clues that give insights to the person speaking. Notice the gestures, the way the person sits or stands, the smile or frown, anything and everything indicating the frame of mind at that particular moment. Listen to the way the person is speaking, the speed as well as the tone of voice and intensity. And listen empathetically, always asking yourself how you would feel if you were in the prospect's shoes. And, of course, listen with an open heart as you carefully observe the speaker's emotional involvement in the words chosen. And most important, do not interrupt and never finish a phrase, thought, or sentence when your prospect pauses. Another factor involved in being a good listener is the law of reciprocity. When we carefully listen to the prospects elaborate on their interests, desires, hobbies, and other thoughts, we are putting them in debt to us. They then have a feeling that they owe us something in return, and consequently, they are more willing to listen to our story since we've given them the courtesy of listening to them. To apply this information, make it a point to listen more than you speak. Do it today and every day. Mentally tune in to the other person without thinking about how you will reply. Physically get ready to listen by looking the person in the eye and slightly lean toward them, and as you develop the skill of listening intently, you will get more sales as a result. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable to fire off a series of questions to prospects you are meeting for the first time. The POGO formula will give you a track to run on that doesn't feel like an interrogation. It's a conversational way to ask questions at the beginning of the process. You can adapt POGO, P-O-G-O, to your own style while you are showing sincere interest in your prospect.
These questions are designed to give you a chance to build rapport with the prospect as well as to begin gathering information on how best to make the sale. While you ask questions, it will be important for you to talk about yourself and your organization also to the extent that you find common ground. The rule is you should talk about your own pogo story only 25% of the time and let the prospect talk 75% of the time. The P in the POGO formula stands for person. You will want to ask questions about the prospect and the other people involved in the sales process. This makes your prospect feel important. You connect on a personal level and you show respect for other decision makers while you are designing a series of questions relating to the person. Remember that it is okay to share some personal information about yourself, but you already know about you. Give just enough about yourself to express common interest, but not enough to monopolize the conversation. Some sample questions you might ask are, how did you get into this particular business? Or, how long have you been a golfer? Or, what part of the country do you come from originally? To work on using these types of questions, you need to write out your list of possible questions and then practice making them sound conversational. Go as far as to record yourself and ask yourself, would I buy from me? The first O in the POGO formula stands for organization. Ask questions about the organization, department, and team. Learn about the company's structure, decision-making process, headquarters, and brand names. Probe gently and be willing to talk about your organization in the places you have positive common ground or you can sincerely compliment the prospect. Be sensitive to what the prospect wants to know about you and your company. Some prospects are very anxious to know about you, and you must give them enough information to build confidence that your company is solid and reputable. However, do not monopolize the conversation. Your objective is to give them enough information to build that confidence and to gather enough information to make you effective at knowing how to close the sale. Here are some sample questions that might be adaptable for you. What are the company's plans for the future? How would you rate the performance of support personnel? Is your organization growing at the rate you desire? Take these questions and others that would work for your situation and make a list. Keep the list handy the next time you are talking to a prospect and see if some of them can be worked into the conversation. The G in the POGO formula stands for goals. This is the time for gathering information about personal and professional goals, such as what do you plan to accomplish in the next six months? And what goals do you have in place for the next year? If the prospect's goals involve money, I want you to think about what they are really saying. Money is never a goal. What can be done with the money is the real goal. When you ask a prospect about goals and you get a money response, follow up with, why would that be important to you? This will help you to discover the true goals of the prospect. The second O stands for obstacles. Ask about what must be overcome in order to reach the goals. This is where you start to get an idea of what problems they face for which you may have a solution. You can ask, would you be willing to share some of the problems your organization faces? Or, what is preventing you from being where you want to be? What challenges must be met before you can achieve your goal. Use the POGO profile to show you are sincerely interested in understanding the prospect and the organization. During this time, your complete focus is on the prospect, not on your product. 
The order of how you ask the questions is up to you. You do not have to ask all your people questions first before asking about the organization. If you have practiced your list of questions beforehand, you will be able to adapt them conversationally to this particular prospect. Preparation is key to asking the right questions to get the right information. Have you ever seen cartoons where the character gets an idea and suddenly a light bulb pops up above his head? Generally that means he's now aware of something he didn't know before. As you move from building trust and rapport with the pogo questions that we covered in another lesson, you are now trying to identify the prospect's needs. This is also achieved through the art of asking specific questions. During this stage in the sales cycle, it is important for both you and the prospect to be fully aware of his needs. This is critical before you start to sell a solution. Imagine a light bulb indicating need awareness that is suddenly illuminated above your head as you ask him questions, because you have now begun to uncover and understand his needs. By asking the right questions, you will uncover needs of which he was not aware. You might say to yourself, oh, now I understand what he's saying, or, yeah, I understand what he needs. If you don't have this need awareness, you won't know what to recommend. You can't move to the solution step until you have clearly determined in your mind what the prospect needs. You are better able to identify a need and offer the solution when you are an expert in your own product, you have pricing knowledge, industry knowledge, and competitor knowledge. As the saying goes, knowledge is power. The more you know about your offering, the easier it is to see how it can solve needs your prospects have. The more you know before you begin your sales presentation, the better armed you are to tailor your offering to specifically what the prospect needs. A common mistake is for salespeople to probe for needs, discover one, and take off in solving the problem, all before the prospect has decided it is indeed a need he has. Not only must the light bulb go off over your head to understand the need, the light bulb must go off over the prospect's head too. Until you both clearly have identified the needs and wants, it is not time to begin showing off your great product. Keep asking questions. In another lesson, we will discuss how to help your prospects see the need also. But today, you can apply this information by creating a list of questions that you can use to begin to gently probe for knowledge, for the needs that your prospect may have, whether they know it or not. If you have not first listened to Uncovering Needs Part 1, I suggest that you complete that lesson before moving on to this lesson. In this lesson, we will discuss what happens with the prospect during the needs awareness part of the sales cycle. Even when you are sure you have discovered the client's needs, you must continue to probe for two basic reasons. One, to be sure you have the true need and not a symptom of the need. And two, to be sure the prospect understands that there really is a need. When a skilled salesperson, such as yourself, probes with the right questions, the person who may have been denying the problem is permitted to discover the problem. Since he discovered it, he will be far more open to discovering solutions, which is where you come in. In order for the prospect to be interested in your solutions, he must be upset with his current condition. He must feel out of balance. The natural law of homeostasis states that an organism stays in balance until and unless an outside force acts upon it. The force causes the status quo to be disruptive, and the organism becomes out of balance. The organism strives to regain balance or get back to status quo. The same is true for your prospects. Once out of balance, they will usually take action to correct their balance. Human beings don't make changes until they know they are out of balance. Now, I'm not saying you should literally knock your prospect off balance. Instead, you must discover where there is an imbalance and point it out in a convincing manner. In essence, this makes your prospect uncomfortable or unhappy with his condition or situation, which means you are now in position to make a sale because your prospect wants to solve his problem. What happens when a prospect becomes unbalanced? Well, there are three things that can happen when customers discover their area of imbalance. In the first place, the professional salesperson, you, who has helped point out the lack of balance, places the product or service in the hands of the prospect, makes the sale, and now has to worry about how to spend their commissions. In the second place, the prospect discovers their imbalance 
and if the salesperson doesn't ask for the order, over a period of time, the prospect regains balance and forgets he was ever uncomfortable. This is disastrous because the prospect is not doing very well and neither are you. In the third place, when the prospect discovers they are out of balance and the salesperson doesn't ask for the order, many times the competition comes in and asks for the order, writes the prospect and makes the sale. Then everyone is happy but you. It's important that you know how to identify the needs and how to get the prospect to also identify their needs. To apply this information today, make a list of common areas of imbalance that your product or service can solve. Then develop some pointed, specific questions you will ask for the prospect to begin to see their needs. You have a prospect that seems generally satisfied with his business or his family life, depending on your sales focus. What can you do to help him feel a need for the solution you want to present to him? In other words, for your product. You may be in a sales situation where people come in with a need already. Your focus is to make sure you understand the need or help them to clarify their real need. Either way, how do you disrupt the status quo? Remember, selling isn't just telling. Selling is asking. A professional salesperson knows how to use questions to guide the conversation along. A salesperson unsure of himself is afraid to let the prospect speak for fear of never getting the chance to present his solution. But a prospect is less likely to buy if they are not convinced they first have a need. And needs are uncovered with questions. Your questions need to be practiced, drilled, and rehearsed. It is not by accident that a professional salesperson gets the prospect to realize they need the service or product being offered. It is with carefully crafted questions that the salesperson reaches the goal of a sale. Some examples of questions that help get the prospect out of status quo are, how satisfied are you with your current situation? What would you change about your current vendor if you could? Are you dissatisfied enough to take action today? How has your business changed recently for you to be willing to consider a new solution? Would it be helpful to know which other companies in your industry have used our product successfully? Have you considered what you would lose if you waited to make a change? What is the most important decision you must make before you can decide to change? The more precise the question, the sooner you get the information you need to uncover a need. Many times salespeople attempt to present their solution before the prospect is ready. The only way for you to know if your prospect understands he has a need and feels off balance is by asking smart, well thought out questions. Communication can be a tricky thing. I may be trying to communicate one message, but you hear something entirely different. Or I may say one thing, but mean something else. It reminds me of the classic scenario of when a husband comes in and gets the cold shoulder. In bewilderment, he asks his wife, Honey, what's wrong? She replies with a curt, Nothing. And woe to the man who takes her word for it. She doesn't mean nothing by any stretch of the imagination. The same cross wires can happen with our prospects if we're not paying attention. When you're ready to present your sales presentation to the prospect, pay close attention to what they are not saying. In other words, they may be verbally saying yes, you may proceed, but non-verbally, they're showing resistance. This may be when the prospect takes a step backwards, or sighs, or allows other people in the office to continually interrupt your presentation, or even checks their email. All of these are signs that the prospect has not bought into your presentation. You can continue to make the presentation to this disinterested audience and waste time for both of you, or you can deal with it. As soon as you see one of those negative, nonverbal messages, state the obvious without accusing the prospect of resisting. Don't attempt to present a solution to the prospect if they're giving you signals that he's still not ready to hear what you have as a solution. He will give you clues that his balance is not upset or that he feels like he doesn't know enough about you or your solutions. Be careful. If you rush into the presentation before you've built value and gotten to know the prospect, you'll come across as a pushy salesperson. To identify the prospect's resistance, ask questions like, 
It looks like you still have some reservations about hearing my presentation. Where are you uncomfortable? Or, I understand that you're ready to consider a change. Did I misjudge the situation? Or, what have you seen or heard that you don't agree with? At this point, you can answer any concerns or address any issues and then continue on with your presentation. Always be looking for the nonverbal body language that gives you signs of resistance, such as looking away or handling their notes, and try to manage the situation. Also look for signs of encouragement when the prospect leans forward, touches your product, smiles, nods, or even rubs their chin. All of these are nonverbal signs showing interest in what you're saying. During your presentation, prospects are deciding whether your product will meet their needs at a price they are willing to pay. You must be able to read whether your information is leading them to say yes, no, or maybe. To apply this information today, observe carefully the body language of each prospect you see and afterwards record specific positive and negative body language responses. This will help you to focus on this aspect of communication and keep you alert to all the signals your prospect is giving you. You are a professional salesperson. I bet you know your product so well that you could talk about it in your sleep. But this expertise can sometimes lead to problems. For example, have you ever found yourself putting your sales presentation on autopilot? You want to avoid this because it makes you seem like a robot and appear insincere and disinterested. Another problem that can arise is sometimes when you are so familiar with your product, you assume the prospect is just as familiar, so you tend to hurry the presentation and try and close too early. For example, don't assume your prospect knows about all the features of this car just because they have driven other cars. Take the time to explain all the relevant features and benefits of your product or service, even though they may seem obvious to you. Your prospect will let you know if you are going too slowly, but they will not always let you know if you are going too fast. On the other hand, one disadvantage of so much knowledge and enthusiastic confidence is that you probably believe the prospect wants and needs to hear every detail about your products. Remember, I said to slow down and tell the prospect about the relevant features and benefits. What prospects really want to hear is that you understand their needs and problems and that there is a solution. When you introduce features and benefits in your presentation that are not rele relevant to the prospect's needs, you distract them with too much information. When you are asking questions to uncover their needs, you will begin to get a sense of what the problems are what solutions you can offer, and what benefits are important to this particular prospect. Therefore, your presentation will be tailored to the prospect's needs, this prospect's benefits, and the solution this prospect is looking for. When you frame your presentation around this knowledge, you will not be as tempted to overwhelm them with every feature. Only the ones which are relevant to this prospect. Now, after the sale has been made, it is okay to educate the prospect on more features or to bring up additional products that may solve other problems that the prospect may have. The key point is that your presentation should always emphasize the product's features, and benefits that have been uncovered during the question step of the sales process. Anything else is a distraction. To apply this information today, you will want to listen and coach yourself to make sure you are not overloading your prospects and customers with too much information. Keep your sales presentation centered on this particular prospect's needs. When you want your prospects to take action, you will talk about the benefits to them and lead with needs. In another lesson, we will look more in depth at how and why to lead with needs. Today, I want to discuss with you how to present the benefits of what you sell clearly to your prospects. 
it's been my experience that salespeople like to point out the features of their products, while in their minds they believe they are pointing out the benefits of their offering. And there is a difference. Let's get some definitions out of the way. A feature is a trait or characteristic of your product or service. In other words, what it is. A function is the act the feature performs for the user. In other words, what it does. The benefit is what the feature does for me. Let's think through those definitions together. Look at this ballpoint pen. The features I want to point out to you is the clip. But I don't want to spend my time talking to you about the clip itself. I want to point out the function of the clip, and that is it holds the pen in the shirt pocket. But I don't want to spend my precious time with you talking very much about the function of the clip. What you are interested in is what the clip does for you. The benefits to you are it saves you time by not misplacing the pen. You always know where to look for it. And it saves you money by not having to constantly replace the pen that you lost. Now, how do you say that conversationally? Well, it could sound like this. You said you're always losing your pens, which slows you down and wastes money. One of the features of our pen is its clip. It's a strong and more flexible clip than any other top-selling pen, and it has been proven in stress tests. Now, the benefit to you is you'll always have your pen handy because it stays in your pocket, and you'll save money because you'll be buying fewer pens. The most important step in that example, and more importantly for you, is to match your benefits with a prospect's needs. In a sales presentation, if you can show the prospect how he can receive all the benefits you described, does he care what you call it? No. While we get excited about brand names, model numbers, and other marketing identifications, most of the time the prospect doesn't care as long as it delivers the benefit. Be careful of overloading the prospect's head with information he doesn't need. Be sure he clearly understands what the product will do for him. To apply this information today, answer these questions. What are the three most important parts or aspects or features of your product or service? Secondly, what act does that part or aspect perform? In other words, what does your product or service do? And last, what are the primary reasons that others would want to purchase your product or service? In other words, what does your product or service do for the prospect? By answering these questions, you will have a list of features, functions, and benefits you can share with your prospect. You may want to listen to the other lesson that continues with learning how to clearly communicate the benefits to your prospect so that you can close more sales. If you've not listened to the prior lesson on feature, function, and benefit, you may want to complete that lesson before starting this lesson. Salespeople need to clearly understand that prospects do not buy what the product is. They buy the benefits that the use of the product will bring them. Anti-lock brakes mean very little to the average driver until you explain that they may prevent those dangerous skids on slippery highways. Steel belted radial might mean very little unless you explain that it enables the driver to get an extra 15,000 safe miles out of a set of tires. Guaranteed renewable might mean little to a senior citizen until you explain that the company can't cancel the policy at any age. Five inches of insulation mean nothing until you translate them into lower heating and air conditioning costs. In short, always give a benefit when you describe a feature and function. To avoid confusion and make the proper use of feature, function, and benefit, we need to add the bridge. The bridge is a phrase preparing the prospect to hear the benefit. The phrase shouts, look out, here comes the benefit, the advantage, the reason for you to buy. Sample bridge statements are, the advantage to you, Mr. Williams, is, or you will enjoy this because, or even the benefit to you, Laura, is. So when you point out a feature and tell the prospect what it does, to tie it down, you must personalize it with the benefit they would be interested in. For example, let's say I sell memberships to a gym. I might say, Mike, you said you'd like to work out late at night because it helps you relax. One of the features of our fitness center is that it's open 24 hours a day. Since we're never closed, you can use the facilities anytime. The advantage to you is you can work out and relax as late as you like. You can probably understand why some people sell only functions, in other words, what it does. But beware of this trap. What your product or service may do is very interesting, and it may even convince me that you know your business and understand the value of your product. However, functions probably won't cause me to give you my money. 
That will happen when and only when you persuade me to take action by clearly spelling out what's in it for me. When you show me the advantages I get from using your product or service, now we're truly communicating. So you want to personalize the benefits for the prospect. Paint the person into the picture of driving that luxury car, receiving compliments on the beautiful dress or suit, looking at the sunset on the lake where the new home has been constructed, or sitting in the comfortable retirement environment provided by the investment being made. Paint the picture so your prospect sees personal benefits. If you are struggling with feature, function, or benefit for your product or service, imagine how your prospects must feel. If you don't clearly understand and can't clearly articulate the difference, you may be losing sales to those who can. To apply this information today, take the list you made in the last lesson of your feature, function, and benefits and begin using a bridging phrase with your prospect to personalize the benefit and begin to get them to see themselves taking advantage of your offer. The last two lessons were about emphasizing the benefits of what you offer. But you want to be sure that you're not putting too much emphasis on your product too early. You want to lead with the need instead of leading with your product. For each product you are presenting, state the need first and then link the need to the solution. In other words, your product and its features and benefits. How can you lead with the prospect's needs if you don't know them? You can't. And that means before presenting your solution, you must be asking questions to find out the prospect's needs. You see, people do not buy products. They buy products of the products, or also known as benefits. For example, I want a professional corporate image, not a suit. Or I want a good night's sleep, not necessarily a mattress. Or I want the bragging rights with my buddies, not a new golf club. Once I've established what the need is for the particular prospect, I will first state the need, use a transition question for the direct agreement, then present the product and its benefits as the solution. Let's say I've been working with a prospect. I've used questions to find out that John wants to have time to train his staff and more time to spend with his family. The barrier is his bad health. So I would say, John, if I could show you a way that you could feel better, have time and energy to train your staff and participate in more activities with your family, would you be interested? You see, I lead with his most pressing needs and transition with a yes or no question in which the obvious answer is yes, I am interested. Now you have the prospect's attention. Then you go on to present your product or service with all its glorious benefits. To apply this information today, be conscious of how you transition to your sales presentation. After finding out the needs of your prospect, lead with the need and then tell the prospect the benefits of your solution. I'm Ziegler and I want to talk to you about the power that you have in the words you use. You want to be careful about the language you use. You need to use words that sell like understand, proven, easy, proud, profit, and value. Some words, of course, will turn the prospect off. They unsell. The words deal and cost and pay and try and difficult and obligation are things most prospects don't want to hear. They are more interested in hearing the word invest instead of buy. They find it easier to make deposits each month than to make payments. Words that sell are very important. For example, we use word pictures as a very positive approach to open the prospect's mind. Paint word pictures as often as you can. Here's one of my favorites. Several years ago, the New York Times printed a story of how a New Jersey housewife feeling for her home combined with her sense of what makes good advertising copy in one day sold a home that five brokers had been carrying for three months. Mr. and Mrs. Lowe decided to sell their two-bedroom home to buy a larger one since space was becoming a problem. The brokers ran typical standard ads like cozy six-room home, ranch style with fireplace, garage, tile baths, and hot water heat, convenient to Rutgers campus, stadium, golf courses, and primary school. Those are facts 
But people do not buy facts or even benefits unless they can see those benefits translated to their own personal use. After three months, Mrs. Lowe ran an ad herself. She was anxious to get something done and believed that she could sell her home. Here's the way she ran an ad. We'll miss our home. We've been happy in it. But two bedrooms are not enough for us, so we must move. If you like to be cozy by a fire while you admire autumn woods through wide windows protected from the street, if you like a shady yard in summer, a clear view of winter sunsets, and quiet enough, to hear frogs in spring, but city utilities and conveniences. You might like to buy our home. We hope so. We don't want it to be empty and alone at Christmas. Out of the six responses the next day, one person bought the home. This technique of painting word pictures can work for you, too. To apply this information and learn to paint word pictures, I encourage you to start painting those word pictures in your own mind, sharing them with your friends and associates. Memorize them. Make certain you have them clearly in order, and then you will be able to use them effectively. When you start painting those word pictures of satisfaction, gratifications, joy and delight. With the prospect, you can see uh, benefiting and using what you have to offer. If a doctor had just diagnosed you with a serious infection, would she not create a sense of urgency for you to take immediate action? Take the medicine before it gets worse? Or if your mechanic had just found a crack in your engine, would he not create a sense of urgency for you to get it fixed before the car breaks down and leaves you stranded? Or if your plumber had just found a leaky pipe under your house, wouldn't you expect him to create a sense of urgency? Repair it before the house develops foundational problems? Each of these professionals uncovered a serious need and recommended an immediate solution. What would you think about a professional salesperson who is not aggressively concerned enough about the customer to recommend purchasing one or maybe even two of the products that would meet the need, fix the problem, or increase the satisfaction and gratification of the prospect sooner rather than later? We know that in our presentations, we must lead with need, emphasize benefits that are specific to the prospect, and pay attention to the prospect's nonverbal messages. To increase our closing ratio, we must also communicate a sense of urgency to, so the prospect will take action now. It's one thing to persuade the prospect that our products are the best, and another thing to persuade him to purchase now. The best way to create a sense of urgency is to paint a vivid picture of what the prospect will gain if he takes action now, and what he will lose if he waits. These gains and losses must appeal to his emotions. As Mr. Ziegler states, emotions move us to action faster than logic will. Can you think of an example of when this is true for you? Take, for instance, someone on a diet. Logically, the dieter knows to ignore the dessert at the end of the salad bar. But if the dieter emotionally needs that dessert, logic will not stop him. No matter how strong the facts are about the calories and fat included in that dessert, the dieter helps himself to a dessert to feed an emotional need. To get your prospect emotionally involved, he must be able to visualize the risk he is taking by not having the product and experience the emotion of fear about that risk. The mind works in pictures. Words and stories paint pictures, both positive and negative. To apply this information today, create some vivid word pictures that help the prospect picture how tragic it would be to go another day without the benefits of your product or service. Think about how you can describe what would happen if they fail to act now. Create a sense of urgency to make the buying decision today. When you meet a prospect for the first time, they instantly, some say within three to four seconds, form an impression of you. Then you spend the rest of your time with that person either changing their mind or confirming what they thought. If you meet with your customers in person, one of the first things that people will notice about you is your appearance. The clothes you choose to wear make a statement about you. We have a choice in what statement we want to make. Think about the people you will be presenting to. 
you always want to dress either at the level of dress they will have or higher, never lower. The statement you're striving for is, I am like you, you can trust me. So when you're meeting with a group of corporate executives, you will probably want to wear your most professional clothes, a coat and tie. If you're meeting with the technical staff, you might go with a casual shirt and pants. If you're meeting with the production line and going over how the new equipment works, you'll probably want to dress in short sleeves and khakis. You get the point. Dress to make the statement that says, you can trust me. If you're meeting the prospect or customer face to face, there are several elements that come into play. Research indicates that when we communicate with someone face to face, only 7% of what they pick up on is our word choice. 38% is our tone of voice, and the biggest component is our body language, which is 55% of our message. In that light, we need to be careful with what our body might be saying in contrast with what our words are saying. How you shake hands, stand, or sit during your presentation can speak volumes. And if you're not aware of it, you may be sending the wrong message. You want to stand or sit in a neutral stance. Standing this way or sitting with your hands on the table this way, don't say anything really. That means that the listener is not distracted by your body language and can focus on your message. Standing in a fig leaf can say different things to different people. Closed off, nervous, stiff. I've asked a lot of people, and while I don't always get the same answer, I always get a negative answer. Standing with your arms crossed may be comfortable, but does it send the message you want? How does this look? I'm so pleased that you asked me back. Part of my message said I was glad, but 55% of my message said, you scare me. It is okay to be nervous. It is not okay to show nervousness. If you're on the phone, you take away 55% of how we communicate, your body language. Instead, your word choice and tone of voice become more important. To apply this information today, look at yourself right now. What statement are you making? Is there something you need to change in your appearance to make the appropriate statement? Next time you're making a sales presentation, think about your body language. Are you being neutral, or is your body language saying you want to be anywhere but here? These are subtle yet important aspects to being a more professional salesperson. When speaking with someone with the intent to persuade them, you need to have all the logical facts and reasons it's a good idea to take action. However, you must also tap into the emotional side to make me want to take action. As we have pointed out in previous lessons, People buy for emotional reasons and back it up with logical reasons. There are many ways to tap into people's emotions during your sales presentation. You can paint word pictures with vivid word choices. You can paint a picture of the risk of not having the benefits of what you're offering. And you can also paint pictures with your gestures. Gestures are simply an extended expression of you. Basically, it is hand and arm movements that make a point. This will help the audience follow what you're saying. It helps your audience stay with you during your presentation. We tend to think and store information in pictures rather than words. So the more I can help you picture my message, the easier you will remember and be involved with my message. You may be thinking, I've always been told to stop using my hands. Actually, what I think people mean is to make your hand movement meaningful. In other words, make your hand movement specific and dovetail with the words you're saying. Repetitive movement is not using your hands effectively. It is annoying and distracting. However, matching a specific word with a specific gesture will make you more interesting as a presenter and will help your customer or prospect paint a mental picture of what you're saying. For example, if I was selling software, then during my presentation I may say, after working with our software over time, it will begin to be intuitive to your needs and even perform multi-step processes for you with the click of a mouse. The gestures add the needed polish to your presentation and impact to your words. To apply this today, look for opportunities in your presentation that lend themselves to gestures. Things like numbers, directions, and verbs are easy to place to begin using gestures. This skill is a subtle skill to make your presentation even more interesting and professional. You've heard it said that you can't trust a person who can't look you in the eye. 
While that may have some truth to it, the fact is the best con artist in the world can look you straight in the eye and take all your money. Even so, we still tend to associate good, steady contact with your eyes to trustworthiness. Your prospects will buy from you for a number of reasons, and one of those reasons, they trust you. When presenting your solution to their problem, in other words, during your sales presentation, it's important to practice good, steady eye contact. You can think of eye contact as a handshake. A weak handshake gives people a negative impression. A firm handshake gives people a positive impression. The same is true for your eye contact. Eye contact that is strong is called eye clasp. This is when you make solid contact with another person for three, four, or five seconds. Now, most of us are comfortable looking at someone and then immediately looking away. But staying with a person, the prospect, for a full four seconds communicates trust, understanding, confidence, professionalism, and a whole host of other positive qualities. Now, I don't expect someone to think about what they're saying and count at the same time. In other words, the prospect is going to be looking at you. You're going to be looking at the prospect. You're not going to be counting one, two, three, four. Instead, to accomplish this three, four, five seconds, just try to complete a thought or a sentence with someone before shifting your eye contact. Now, on the other hand, don't stare. Going over five seconds can make the other person uncomfortable. If you're presenting to a group of people and you can spread the eye contact around to everyone, if you are presenting to just one, you want to have one-on-one, -on -one. but presenting to several, you want to make sure that you look at one or two people before you break eye contact and looking at your notes or at your PowerPoint. You want to avoid shifting your eyes back and forth between two or more people. This makes you look shifty-eyed and therefore not trustworthy. Be careful and do not drop your eyes when you are handling an objection or going over the less desirable aspects of your service. Again, keeping steady eye contact will convey confidence and competency on your part and in what you're saying. To apply this information today, practice making three, four, five seconds eye contact with every person you have a conversation with today. Now, it may feel uncomfortable at first, but your comfort level will grow as you practice more. And you are more concerned with being effective than being comfortable, aren't you? I'm Zig Ziglar. And if you're going to be a successful salesperson, you must develop a closing attitude. Another name for closing could be need satisfaction. It's what you have been building up to do. You offer your product or service as the need solution. Closing sales doesn't have to be painful for you or the prospect. In fact, it's a win-win situation if you've done everything for the benefit of the prospect. Asking for the order is the natural progression that must occur. Do it pleasantly. Do it professionally and ask. The proper approach in following these suggestions will put you in a win-win situation, meaning you have now reached agreement with the prospect and you clearly understand that the sales process is something you do for a person and not to that person. The closing attitude is your understanding that you are there to solve a problem or prevent some in the future. To apply this information today, realize that regardless of circumstances, technical knowledge, type of prospect, experience, investment, or anything else, always ask for the order. If your prospect says no, the reason is most often that they do not know K-N-O-W enough to say yes. In that case, you begin the process of managing objections today. Go out there with a positive closing attitude and make those sales. Remember, nothing happens until somebody sells something. Today, let that person be you. A trial close is a closing effort typically made early in the sales process and commonly used to qualify interest or attempt to close after a buying signal is given by the prospect. Any time you ask a question to seek agreement on a minor decision that leads to the major decision, you're using a trial close, aren't you? These questions tell you if you're getting buy-in from the prospect based on the response, don't they? When you add a trial close, 
You are asking for action, a decision that leads to the sale. They can sometimes be referred to as direct agreement questions. This is not an attempt to close, but more a test to see if the prospect is getting closer to closing the sale. Some trial close examples are, does that sound about right to you? Or along with that helmet, do these other safety items make sense together? Or you don't want to delay getting the compound interest, do you? Or it looks like you really like this, is that true? Remember, you can't make anyone change his or her mind. You can only give them new information to make a new decision. Each time you present new information or benefit, ask a trial close question with it. For example, did I mention the software is Mac compliant? Could your entire team benefit from the same upgrades? Or, this vitamin comes in liquid form, which means it enters your bloodstream faster than a solid tablet. So this would go down easier and better, wouldn't it? Your trial closes can also start with if. For example, if this was only available with the fax machine model, it would still be a good deal, wouldn't it? When you ask the question, pause. Let there be silence. You are watching and listening for your prospect's response. Was it a polite, eh, I guess so? That means you've got more selling to do. Was it an enthusiastic, yes? Maybe you've sold enough and it's time to ask for the order. Was it a skeptical or sarcastic answer? And you've got to work towards adding value to your offer. Any of these signs is okay. It shows you where you are and how much further you have to go. Be careful about using a trial close too early in the process or too often. You can annoy and even turn your prospects off. Use your good judgment and tune into their body language and tone of voice to make sure there is no hint of annoyance. You can apply this information today by practicing this concept on your friends and coworkers until they ask you to go away. Only with practice will this become natural for you. The right tone of voice with the right sincerity will let you and your prospect win. Although there are literally hundreds of ways to ask for the order, we will be sharing a few from the field that are tested and reliable. It is good if you know lots of different closes, but do you know them well enough to use them at a moment's notice in the proper sales environment? In other words, learn and practice many different kinds of closes. However, make sure you know them well and can use them for the genuine good of the prospect. The key is this, don't reinvent the wheel. Go to school on uh, other people's experience. After working with these closes a while, you will be able to personalize them and make them fit your sales presentation. The first close, is the three questions close. You use these three simple questions. First, can you see where this would, and you insert the primary benefit that would cause the prospect to buy. Second, you ask, are you interested in, then you state the benefit again. And third, you ask, if you were ever going to start this benefit, when do you think would be the best time to start? It might sound like this. John, can you see where this would save you money? Are you interested in saving money? If you were ever going to start saving money, when do you think would be the best time to start? If, and this is a big if, if you have made your presentation in such a way that you can expect an affirmative answer to questions, or to question one, then the process will work for you. It helps you tie the emotion of the decision to the logic of the decision. The second close you may want to try is the probability close. Once your prospect is at the moment of truth, you may ask the following questions to obtain the order or the information you need to get the order. For example, Mrs. Gonzalez, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 meaning you are ready to place your order, where would you stand right now? Notice the subtleties of the question and choose your words carefully. I didn't say that I meant not interested or where do you fall on the scale. 
You don't want to plant seeds of disinterest or falling for anything. Wait patiently for the response. And when it comes, follow with this question. If you are at seven right now, what would it take to move you to a 10? If you consistently get numbers from the first question that are less than seven, the first parts of your selling process are the problem. This close is best used when you are very close to getting the order but feel there is some resistance you need to get into the open. Handling this resistance or objection gets the problem into the open and enables you to deal with each one properly. And finally, the summary close is a good basic close to know and use. Even though it may seem very basic to you, don't minimize the significance of what may seem obvious. In the summary close, you recap the areas of the presentation that cause your prospect's eyes to light up, that turn the light bulb on, and then ask for the order. It may sound like this. Mrs. Whitmire, you've agreed our system provides speed, ease, and quality. You stated those are the most important benefits to you. Is that correct? After you receive a positive response, you confidently say, then, Let's get the order started. You see, during the sales process, the prospect gets excited about certain benefits. You can provide, but during the sales process, that excitement may begin to die down due to any number of circumstances or directions. By summarizing what caused the fire to burn brightly, you rekindle the flame at the moment you are asking the prospects to make their investment. The more feeling may have at this moment, the more sales you will close. After the prospect has given you the order, one of the most effective nailed-down comments is, Mrs. Whitmire, it would be a big help to me, and I would consider it a personal favor, if you would tell me one more time why you're so excited about owning this product. At this point, you don't need to feel hesitant to ask for a favor. They just bought from you, and one reason is that they like you. The prospect will be willing and even anxious to do you the favor of granting this request. The relationship will be strengthened, and the sales will be even more securely nailed down. To apply this information today, take each of these three closes and work on making it fit your personality, your product, or service, and then practice, practice, practice. You will be sure to close more sales more often with practiced closes that you can deliver with confidence and ease. Perhaps the most frustrating experience a salesperson has to gain agreement from the customer that, yes, the product is good. Yes, it will save money. Yes, he does need it. Yes, he would like to have it. Yes, he really could afford the payments. But no, he is not going to buy. Many times this indicates that the prospect has been convinced of the merits, or at least appears to be convinced, and sold, but he has not been persuaded to take action. At this point in the sales process, it becomes necessary for you to know different closing methods in which to help persuade your prospect to agree to your solution. In another lesson, we looked at three closes you can use. Today, we will continue to share with you four more closes that have been refined out in the field and brought to you for your success. One of the easiest closes to incorporate into your sales presentation is the alternate of choice close. Never give the prospect a choice between something and nothing. Let him choose between something and something else. This close can be used under many circumstances. It may sound like 
Shall I ask the company to ship it as soon as possible? Or would two weeks be better? Or would you like me to rotate the tires too or just do the oil change? Or do you want your store to hem your slacks or will you be taking them to your tailor? The previous purchase clothes is another good clothes to learn. The best way to get a prospect to make a favorable new decision is to make him happy with an old decision. Compliment his past purchases with specific reasons why they were smart. For instance, good quality. Or he used a company with a good reputation. If you attack the previous purchases the prospect has made, then you are attacking them personally. And this does not build a, a risk report. It might sound like this. Brandon, I can tell you value quality because I've noticed that the equipment you have in your office is all high quality. Since quality is important to you, I know you will be eager to get our well-made phone system integrated into your company, won't you? You may be able to use the spare clothes. If you have a product that wears out and needs to be replaced, this clothes may work for you. When you are conducting a service call and you find a part that is wearing, ask the customer to give you their spare part and you will replace it for no charge since you are already there. Nine times out of ten, the customer will not need or have a spare. Show them the worn part. Express your genuine concern for their safety or convenience and offer them a replacement part. When they say yes, bring two parts, one to replace and one to keep as a spare. Many times, the customer will purchase both. If you have many add-on sales, the accessory clothes may be perfect for you. After your customer has made the initial major purchase, schedule a service call with them. Before you go, prepare a dream order. It is big, complete, comprehensive, and expensive. Prepare a second accessory order that is also substantial, but not as much as the first order and prepare a minimum order. When you get there and have completed your service, present all these orders. You will have a small percentage who take the dream order. You will have a percentage that will purchase the middle of the road order. After looking at the first two proposals, many prospects who initially felt they couldn't afford anything will become enthusiastic buyers of the minimum order. To apply this information today, pick the clothes you want to try and practice it until you can say it with your own words and a natural, comfortable style. Each clothes you use should be an educational process in which you are able to raise the value of the product or service in the prospect's mind. These clothes are meant to help you do that. As always, any technique is meant to be used with integrity, sincerity, and with the genuine interest of the prospect at heart. What keeps you from closing? Research from Dr. Herb True of Notre Dame reveals that 46% of the salespeople he interviewed asked for the order once and then quit. 24% asked for the order twice before giving up. 14% asked the third time. And 12% hang in there to make the four attempts before throwing in the proverbial towel. That's a total of 96% who quit after four closing attempts. And yet the same research shows that a full 60% of all sales are made after the fifth closing attempt. How many times do you attempt to close the sale before you leave? If the answer isn't five, then you may need to go back and try, try again. For those of you who are reluctant to ask for the order, more than once or twice for fear of coming across as high pressure. Salespeople, think about this. When baseball pitchers reject a ball, the ball is returned to the umpire who puts it in his pouch with the other baseballs. Later, that same ball will be given to the pitcher. Seldom, if ever, 
is the same ball rejected twice. In the same way, the prospect will look at your offer in a different light the second, third, fourth, and even the fifth time. Just as a professional baseball umpire offers the same baseball to the pitcher, so must the professional salesperson offer the same product to the prospect several times. Asking for the order five times or more can be extremely difficult if you A, don't have a deep belief in the value of your product or service, B, haven't done the proper job with the beginning steps of the sale process, or C, don't expect to make the sale. Not so incidentally, let me point out that between each closing effort, you must give a bit additional reasons, features, functions, and benefits for the prospect to make the yes decision today. When you offer added information, you allow the prospect to make a new decision based on additional information. Many times we don't ask the questions because we don't want to hear the no. This is where you'll want to give yourself a gut check. To do this, you need to debrief each sales call immediately after the presentation. That is, get alone and relive the experience. This is most effective when you keep a written journal of your observations. Ask yourself, did I ask for the order? If not, why? If some of your answers are, the timing just wasn't right, the prospect was distracted, there were too many people around, or she needed time to think it through, Realize these are often excuses for not asking for the order. Don't misunderstand. There are occasions when it's wise to back away and return another day, especially if the amount of investment you are asking the prospect to make is significant. However, in an overwhelming majority of the cases, you need to be honest with yourself and admit you are just making excuses for yourself and you need to ask for the order. To apply this information today, Count how many times you ask for the order with each prospect today. If it's less than five, then tomorrow commit to yourself that you will just try one more time with each prospect. Keep stretching yourself so that you know when you lose a sale, you know it was not because you did not give it your best effort. After you have successfully closed the sale and had the check in hand, now what? Many salespeople think this is the end of the sales process unless and until you need to sell that customer some more. A professional salesperson realizes the close is just the beginning of a long-term relationship. Your interest in the customer after the sale plays a major role in whether she will help you make additional sales. You started this relationship based on trust, and for the relationship to continue, the trust must continue to grow. Customers must be managed reliably and confidently. You probably have many opportunities to contact the customer immediately after the sale is finished. A handwritten thank you note will certainly make you stand out from the crowd of vendors. Or a follow-up phone call after product installation. Do you have product training? A personal invitation to the next webinar or teleconference or in-office demonstration will continue to foster the relationship. It's not necessary for you to be the person doing the training or even for you to attend. Your role is to integrate the customer into your organization's processes as seamlessly and painlessly as possible for the customer. What happens when a customer service issue pops up? Are you quick to forward that email or angry vo voicemail to the customer service department? After all, it's their job. But wait, you have some responsibility in the process. Whether it's a quick introduction to the person or department that will be resolving the issue, or a phone call a day later to make sure the issue was resolved to the customer's satisfaction. The point is, they have a relationship with you first and your company second. Help them navigate through a customer service issue. What are some opportunities you have throughout the year to contact your customers? You may have product updates, company news, or just a checking in call will be appreciated. But squeezing this into your already busy week is probably the biggest issue or excuse you have. However, the benefits of maintaining strong relationships with your customers outweigh the hassle of fitting it into your schedule. Depending on your situation, you can take the early part of the morning or the late part of the afternoon and spend 15 minutes each day in customer service and contact. To apply this information today, make an appointment with yourself for every day this week to spend 15 minutes daily writing notes, making phone calls, or checking in with customers who have already purchased from you. 
they will appreciate the attention and reward you with future sales and referrals. At the end of the sales presentation, whether it results in a yes, no, or maybe, the successful sales professional always asks the prospect for the names of people who might benefit from using the product or service just described. You really have to ask yourself about your level of belief in what you're selling if you're not willing to ask this question. Referrals keep the sales professional in business. Remember, no matter how good your product may be, or regardless of the quality of your presentation, you are bankrupt and out of business if you don't have someone to tell your story to. Customers tend to refer you to people on similar social or business levels as themselves. If you have a customer who fits your profile off a good customer, meaning he has a need for your product and a way to pay for your product, then more than likely his social and business associates will be very much like him. If you didn't ask the customer at the close of the sale, you can always go back and ask later. When asking satisfied customers for referrals, you must first make sure they are in fact satisfied. Clear up any service, billing, or product problems they tell you about. Even if you can't fix it yourself, alert the company and follow up after the company has corrected it. Then, ask your prospect if she is pleased enough with your service to refer you. You can say something like, Donna, it would be a privilege to assist your friends and business partners the same way I'm assisting you. If you would be comfortable enough to share their names and information with me, I guarantee I will do my best to treat them the same way I'm treating you. Or would you rather call them yourself and introduce me? Start by asking for names, then go back and ask for information about each one. Sometimes it helps to jog the customer's memory by painting a picture of where that friend is. For example, at the office, the club, a board of directors, or the neighborhood. Once you have the names, ask your customer whom to call on first and how to prioritize the other names. The key to continuing to get referrals is to report back to your customer, letting her know the results of your calls. Let her know whether it was good, bad, or pending. With that kind of professionalism, she is likely to think more referrals to give you. To apply this information today, ask one of your customers for a referral. Once you see how easy it is, this may become your best lead source. Beyond any reasonable doubt, if you're going to build your sales career to the fullest, you've got to do something that 95% of all salespeople never do. They never deliberately train themselves on how to use their voices more effectively. They don't do any work toward developing voice inflection and voice modulation. The very first thing I would recommend you do is record your sales presentation. Start recording from the beginning of the conversation all the way through how you manage objections and to close the sale. Then listen several times to what you have said and the way you have said it. You're going to be amazed to discover that your effectiveness, notwithstanding, much of what you say is superfluous. In other words, you talk too much and you often speak in a monotone. You will be shocked at the non-answers you give to questions and objections and the number of times you heard what the prospect said but missed what he was saying. When you listen back to your presentation, ask yourself, would I buy from that person? I will give you just one example of how you can use your voice effectively in a sales presentation. Although I must point out that your voice is critical in all parts of the presentation, here I am going to talk about the close. When you have asked for the order and you get a price question, and I am sure that every salesperson watching this sales lesson has at one time or another encountered a price objection. Well, when your prospect says that price is too high, or that is more than we were prepared to pay, or that much is not in our budget, you can repeat almost verbatim 
what the prospect said, but make your voice inflection and the sentence up high so that it sounds like a question. The price is too high. That is more than you are prepared to pay. The voice inflection is important here because you're creating a situation that forces him to defend his statement instead of you justifying the price. That's quite a difference. One puts you on the defense and the other puts you on the offense. The difference is substantial. This is a simple technique, but it's not easy. It will help you to clearly understand the prospect's objection. Is it really price or is it something else? To apply this information today, I want to strongly encourage you to record your presentation and listen back to it. That will be one of the most critical things you can do to help yourself move to the next level of success in your sales career. Secondly, practice saying this next sentence with emphasis placed on different words to make the sentence have a different meaning. The sentence, I did not say he stole her money, said with no inflection, it comes across as a statement of fact. However, it can have different meanings by changing your voice inflection. For example, I did not say he stole her money, implies the statement was said, but by someone else. I did not say he stole her money is a vigorous denial that you said it. I did not say he stole her money, hence that you might have implied it, but you didn't say it. I did not say he stole her money, implies that someone other than the accused stole the money. I did not say he stole her money. Maybe he borrowed it, but certainly didn't steal it. I did not say he stole her money, hence that you got the wrong victim. It was someone else's money that this thief stole. I did not say he stole her money, suggests that he might have stolen something, but certainly not her money. They are the same words, but with an educated change in your voice inflection, you can make those eight words say eight different things. Practicing this sentence with different emphasis places on different words will help you train your voice to have more inflection, which makes you more interesting to listen to and helps you to communicate more effectively. Objections are the key to closing the sale. The person selling elephants gets three basic questions. Where does that thing sleep? What does that thing eat? And who cleans up after it? Now, you may not be in the business of selling elephants, but all sales professionals deal with questions and objections. Some fear that these questions and objections lead the prospect toward the dreaded no response when attempting to close the sale. But actually, Objections are the salesperson's best friend. Asking a question or raising an objection indicates interest or feeling. Think about it. Think of an area that holds little or no interest to you. Whether you thought of basketball, opera, fishing, golf, tennis, ballet, race car driving, you probably have no questions or objections because you have no interest. True selling professionals look forward to questions and objections because they realize that few sales are made without the prospects having enough interest to ask questions and raise objections. Okay, now that you're convinced that it's good for the prospects to ask questions and raise objections, what happens when your answers are not satisfactory and the prospect says no? Once your prospect has said no, they're not going to change their minds and buy from you. Now you may be thinking, what? You're crazy. I've had plenty of prospects say no once, only further into the conversation to say yes to my offer. That's because your prospects will make a new decision based on additional information. You see, when prospects say no, the successful sales professional understands that no must mean the prospects don't know enough to make the right decision. Never argue with them. 
you'll always lose. You may win the argument, but you'll lose the relationship of a long-time satisfied customer. Instead, just understand that you haven't finished your job and accept responsibility for going back and providing the information asked. With additional information, they will now know enough to make a favorable and hopefully new decision. To apply this information today, get excited when you hear objections. Know that you have an interested prospect in front of you. Work on providing additional information to them so that the prospect can make a new decision. When do most of your objections occur? If you receive the same objection during all your presentations, then you probably need to review your presentation. Ask yourself if you're including information in the presentation that anticipates the objection and answers it before the prospect has a chance to voice it. Or if one of the prospect's criteria that you uncovered when you were asking questions is something that you know you can't deliver, you can bring it up yourself and be on the offense instead of defense. For example, Mr. Newman, you said you only buy from companies who have been in business more than 10 years. You know we have a four-year track record, but with all the experience in our group, we do have over 35 years of expertise. Of course, dealing with the objection in the middle of your presentation is difficult unless you're prepared. Always acknowledge that you heard it by briefly promising to address it in your presentation or by stopping your presentation to test it to see if it is something that is really important to the prospect. You can test the validity of an objection by saying, Laurie, suppose that were not an issue, then would you consider my offer? Or you can test an objection by asking, is that the only thing holding you back? Often prospects object when they hear or see something they don't agree with, usually after you've asked a trial close question. Handle the objection by using the process you will learn in the next lesson. And there are times when you would not address the objection immediately. You could acknowledge it with a smile or a quick pause, but delay your answer if you think the prospect is not completely serious about the objection. Pay attention to his nonverbal language to help determine how serious his objection is. If he throws his hands up in the air while saying the price is too high, he is probably more serious than if he said it with a quick wink and a grin. Your timing in responding to him is in proportion to the seriousness of the objection. Here's a caution. If he brings it up a second time, it is important to him and you must handle it immediately. Again, objections are not something to shy away from. They are a chance to further educate your prospect on the benefits that you are offering. To apply this information today, listen to how you handle objections. Are the same ones coming up repeatedly? Do you sound defensive when answering? Do you argue with the prospect? Coach yourself on how to address objections professionally and with confidence. Sales objections, don't you just hate them? Today we're going to get serious about how to manage and overcome sales objections. I'm going to cover four specific principles. Let's start with number one. Whoever has the most information has the most influence. Now what does that mean? The more information you have about the customer, the prospect, the suspect, it's easier to ask questions, gather more information, and overcome objections. You've got to do your homework. If you don't have enough information about the customer before the objection, it's going to be very difficult to manage and overcome that objection. Make sure you're always asking questions. You're only as good as your information. Whoever has the most information has the most influence. Second principle. People will make new decisions only when given new information. If you haven't made a sale on a prospect, you go back to that prospect, you have nothing new to tell the prospect, he's going to make the same decision. Therefore, think about it today. What new evidence can you bring to this person that will allow them to make a new decision? People will make new decisions only when given new information. Number three, question the objection so that you can understand the objection and identify the objection. There's two things going on here. You must ask questions so you can fully understand the objection and identify if that's a true objection. You don't want to deal with false objections. Therefore, you must question the objection to determine if it's true or false. Number four, you overcome objections with evidence, not lip service, not emotion, factual beneficial evidence. 
You may have a third party story to tell this person for evidence. You may have a statistic, you may have a demonstration. If the product is where you can demonstrate it and actually have the person sit down and operate the product, drive the product, that is evidence that may overcome objections. So the four principles again, you need information because if you have information, you have influence. Number two, people do things for their reasons, not yours, which means people will make new decisions when you give them information for their reasons. And number three, objections have to be questioned so that you can understand and identify the objections. And the fourth principle, overcome objections by using evidence, facts, statistics, third party stories. Don't be afraid of objections. Welcome objections because objections can be your friend. If you plug into one of those four principles, you'll be more successful today. You should know more about your customer than you do about your products. The more you know about your customers, the easier it is to communicate effectively with them. The more you know about your customers, the more solid your relationship is going to be with them. And the more you know about your customers, the easier it is for you to add value to your products and services. Today, we'll examine methods of adding value by your actions and by your concerns for your customers. Just what is added value? It is anything you do to serve your customers beyond their expectations. This may require you to think above and beyond your normal duties and responsibilities. Value added is creating a pleasant surprise in the mind of the customer. Now, value added selling is not dropping the price when the customer reacts negatively to the price tag. That is discount selling and we're not talking about discount selling. The trick to adding value is that the value is defined by the customer, not by you. As an example, you may have had a salesperson tell you in the past that their package includes 24 hours of technical expertise that's available to you. Now that is added value, but you may be willing to buy from a discounter and pay a per usage fee for that technical help. So the technical expertise of that package is not of value to you. This means that what is valuable to one customer may be perceived as not as valuable to another. Now here's the question. How then do you know how to exceed a customer's expectation? If you've been doing a professional job of selling up to this point, then you should know an awful lot about the customer. By spending so much time in the beginning of the sales cycle asking questions and listening carefully, you have an idea of what is important to that customer. It may be speed. In that case, you highlight the quick turnaround time that your company is known for. It might be that you learn cash is tight, so you highlight your payment terms and how to schedule payments. You must add value to the sale by knowing what your customers want. You know what your customer wants by asking questions and building a relationship. Value-added selling is important for several reasons. It allows both you and your company to separate yourself from the competition. It creates a positive impression in the minds of your customer. It improves your word of mouth advertising and it creates an upbeat and positive environment at your place of business. As it becomes more and more difficult to separate yourself from the competition, you need to understand that you are more than anything selling relationships. That's right, selling relationships. You see, you're not in the selling business, you're in the people business. The more value you give people, the more willing they are to transact business with you. One of the best indicators of good customer service is the perception by your customer is that you have exceeded their expectations. Selling is not just a constant competent job. It's exceeding customers' expectations time and time again. Let me give you a quick example where my expectations were exceeded. The man I buy my suits from knows that I travel extensively for my business. He offered to bring my suits to the office for me so that I would not have to add one more errand to my list when I have time in town. Because he had taken the time to get to know about me, my business, my concerns, he knew that time with my family was precious when I was in town. Do you think I ever think about going anywhere else to buy my clothes? Of course not. No way. Once you begin to look for ways to add value, I know you can find them. To apply this information today, brainstorm on your own or with a team of at least six different ideas on how you can exceed your customer's expectations. Now there are dozens of ways you can add value to your day and to your day-to-day -day interactions with your customers, from handwritten thank you notes to follow-up phone calls. Another way is to clip articles from newspapers about your client and send it to them or hand it to them the next time you meet with them. Added value is a great selling tool. It shows that you really care about the customer as a person. 
It shows that you are tuned into their needs. It shows that you care enough about them to go the extra mile. Upselling is a term used to describe moving a customer up to an upgraded product or adding a different product or service at an increased cost. Let me stress, upselling is something you do for the customer, not to the customer. In other words, it should provide an advantage or benefit to your customer. Upselling occurs after the customer has made the initial buying decision. You want to offer additional related products to their initial purchase. The classic example of upselling is when you place your order for a drink or burger at a fast food store and they always say, would you like fries with that? How strange would it be if they asked, would you like car insurance with that? No. When upselling, you want to educate the customer on other products or services you have that will complement their buying decision. Do you have volume discounts, extended warranties, protective storage bags for the product? software. You get the idea. There are three basic methods you can use to upsell when dealing with a customer either face-to-face -face or on the phone. First, you can ask a question. Second, make a suggestion. And third, explain the advantages. Let's look at the first method, ask a question. Questions will help you have a basis for offering the upsell. Ask how they plan on using the product, or how often they will be using the product. For example, Mr. Jenkins, how many of these brochures do you think you will use in a month? You may be interested to know that we have volume discounts that may prove beneficial to you. Let me tell you what they are and see if they make sense to you. Or secondly, you can make a suggestion. If you know the buying trends of your customers and your products, you can say, other people who have purchased this product have also shown interest in these products. Or you can quote the experts. For example, experts recommend when you purchase a car that you also get upholstery protection and undercoating. Or you can make the suggestion this way. Mr. Customer, since you're doing this, may I suggest this and the benefit to you is this. It may sound like Mr. Jenkins, since you're doing so much more copying these days, may I suggest our volume copy card program? The benefit to you is the reduced price for your copying needs. Or the third method is to explain what the options are and the advantages. Many salespeople leave money on the table because they didn't explain all the options to the customer. You say, Mr. Customer, here is an option and let me explain the advantage to you. For example, Mr. Watts, you have said that you're traveling a lot lately. I'd like to explain the advantages of our nationwide membership program. And then you would go on to explain the benefits and ask if he is interested in enrolling in the program. So when should you upsell? There are opportunities all around the sales process. You can email existing customers offering a product they don't have or that you think they may like based on what you know about them. Or, when you call to thank them for the order, you can suggest a complimentary product they may want. Of course, during the buying phase of the sale, it is a good time to suggest additional purchases. After the initial decision to purchase from you has been made in the prospect's mind, that is the time, and it is easiest then to keep the momentum going. Present your upsell in a positive, assumptive manner. To avoid sounding pushy, begin the upsell with a brief benefit and then ask for the customer's permission to elaborate or describe it. Don't overwhelm the customer with a laundry list of all your other products and services available. The rule of thumb states three products are the most you want to offer at any one time. To apply this information, try to use one of the upsell methods we have just discussed to each of your customers today. You will find that just by educating your customers on what other options are available, that many will take advantage of your offer. In a previous lesson, we discussed how to overcome call reluctance. In this lesson, our focus will be making our business phone calls effective and professional. Telephone skills are not to be taken for granted. Like so many other things in life, 
There is nothing simple about the masterful use of the telephone as a business tool. At no time and at no other place are listening skills as important as when you are handling a business telephone call. When you are on the phone, you have nothing to go on except a person's voice and what they happen to be saying. With this in mind, it is extremely important that you go into any business telephone conversation knowing the five basics. Telephone basic number one is attitude. Here's a point that we've already made in other lessons, but it is so important that we'll make it a gain. Your attitude is paramount. You must project a winning, cooperative can-do attitude at all times. The key to maintaining a positive attitude is maintaining the perception that every call is an opportunity, not an annoyance. You know you can hear attitudes over the phone. Your customer or prospects can tell if you are smiling, annoyed, happy, Whatever attitude you have is clearly projected over the phone. So put a smile in your voice by putting a smile on your face. Telephone basic number two is preparation. Have what you need before you begin. Making your prospecting calls. Have pens, pencils, paper, a resource material, computer, anything you're going to need immediately available. When you are making a call, understand your sales objective and leave nothing to chance. Know clearly what you are trying to achieve. Is it a face-to-face -face appointment to close a sale, to gain permission to send more information? Whatever the objective, you need to have it clearly in your mind before you make the call. Making a sales call with a let's-see-where-it-takes-us attitude will not consistently take you where you want to go. Getting started is telephone basic number three. Whether you're placing a or receiving a call, the first 10 to 15 seconds sets the tone for the entire conversation. If you've got a system from which you do not deviate, then even the most difficult calls will start off on the right foot and continue smoothly. Always try to include the following three elements in the beginning of your call. Your greeting. Your company may mandate how you greet your customers. If not, create a snappy greeting that will set a positive tone. Secondly, Clearly identify yourself and your company. Do not mumble or rush through this. Easy to do when you are familiar with the information, but the person on the other end of the phone has to process what they are hearing, so give them time. And lastly, state the objective of your call. In a previous lesson, you learned about how to use a general benefit statement to gain someone's interest. Telephone basic number four is to remember to keep it professional. This refers to the fact that as professional salesperson, we have to be capable of conveying a professional presence over the phone. We can't afford to answer the phone with a proper and rehearsed response. All to do unintentionally, only to unintentionally hang up on a customer when trying to transfer them or put them on hold. There are several common events that potentially take place during the course of an average telephone call. Take the time to become proficient at them. We all know people who have worked in a given office situation for years and still don't have any idea of how to transfer or conference a call. Learn the system that you work with so that you give the customer the security of knowing they are dealing with a professional. 
telephone basic number five is to be aware of lasting impressions. The last thing the person on the other end hears will possibly be the only lasting impression you will leave. Leave a good impression. The end of any call should include a thank you. Show courtesy and appreciation for the person spending their time with you. A final confirmation of the information delivered or action required, and lastly, a friendly goodbye. To apply this information, monitor yourself as you use the telephone today. Which of these basic five telephone skills do you need to work on to improve your telephone presence? I'm sure you will agree that technology has changed the face of business. People have come to expect instant information, instant answers, and instant solutions to their problems. You must be in constant communication with your customers and prospects to gain and keep their attention. With all the different options available to a salesperson and how you communicate with your customers and prospects, it should make your life easier. But that is not necessarily the truth. Today, we're going to be discussing and focusing on one specific technology, and that is voicemail. How can you use your voicemail to your advantage when you're prospecting? If you leave a message with just your contact information, you're probably frustrated because you get very few people calling you back. Instead, work on a professional, appealing voicemail that will pique someone's interest enough to get them to call you back right away. Let me share a few guidelines as you begin to compose your compelling voicemail. It probably goes without saying that you need to keep it short, no longer than 20 seconds or they will delete your message. Be unique. Do not leave a message that will blend into the other ones that the prospect may have waiting when they return from their meeting. Have a standard message that you use, but if you know anything about the company or the person you're calling, be sure and mention it so that you have built-in familiarity. In another lesson, you're taught how to create a general benefit statement. You may want to review that lesson because this is the perfect place to use that statement. Let your voice show your enthusiasm. I mean, you're doing them a huge favor by offering your exceptional product or service, aren't you? Let your voice show that and share that enthusiasm and clearly state your name and your company name, phone number, and one benefit of your service that may appeal to this prospect specifically. Also, let them know what's in it for them. In other words, your general benefit statement. It might sound like this. Mr. Watts, I am Brad Lee from Dallas Automation. I was calling to see if you might be interested in bringing your energy costs in under budget this year. I would like to schedule 15 minutes with you to show you some hard numbers for the amount of square footage you support. You can reach me at 555-3934. Again, that's 555-3934. Now to apply that information today, compose your general benefit statement and make a script for your voicemail messages. Try several different ways to deliver your statement until you find the one that's causing people to listen and call you back. This may take some perseverance and practice, but once you find a way to make your voicemail work for you, you will find it a great sales benefit. Do you use email effectively in building your business? You may have tried and failed before, but listen closely to these tips and see if you can make your email work for you more successfully. You can use email to educate your current customers about the products they have already purchased as well as what else they need that you offer. Keep in contact with your customers regularly, at least monthly and at the most weekly. It's important that every email you send to an existing customer contain information that they can use for their business in relation to what you offer. In other words, don't constantly send emails asking them just for more business. That will guarantee that your emails will go unread and eventually cause negative perceptions about you and your company. The good news about these kind of emails is that you invest time up front creating them, but after you have developed them, they can be used over and over for any customer who's in that particular part of your product cycle. If you want to use email for a prospecting tool, there are a few ideas to keep in mind. Of course, the first thing you must consider is, is your email list appropriate? Do you have the correct list of people for your offering? Target your emails to the audience most likely to be in the decision-making process for your offering, or your email will likely fall into cyberspace. Secondly, Give the prospect a reason to buy from you. Offer a discount, a free upgrade, a premium service for a regular price. 
Anything that motivates the person to respond to your offer. Be careful about giving a laundry list of products from which the prospect can choose. There is substantial evidence that a one product offering does better than a multiple offering. When creating the email, remember, just like voicemail, you have very little time to capture the prospect's interest. You can even start the email with a benefit that would capture their attention and make them want to read more. Something like, how does saving 30% on your energy costs sound to you? Then you could go on into detail about what you have to offer and how they can take advantage. Make sure your email is easy to read. Absolutely no misspelled words or bad grammar. Use of color can be a good thing unless there's too much of it. Try to look at your email as your prospect would and ask yourself, would I read this? The last idea for email that I want to discuss with you today is the use of articles and newsletters. Your company may have a newsletter and use that list of subscribers for their email marketing. If so, that's a great advantage for you. If you're an independent salesperson or you don't have an organization that has an e-newsletter, you'll want to consider having one of your own list of clients and prospects. You can find an abundance of interesting articles on the internet that can be reprinted in your newsletter. And of course, any short articles that you write will certainly be appreciated for their expertise in your product or service. If you want people to open your emails and then actually read them, add value to them by the addition of a timely article. One very important thing to remember about technology is that although they have been designed to make your job easier, using them as shortcuts or crutches can do more harm than good. Never underestimate the value of the human touch. Dealing with your internal customers. To build a career in the world of sales, you'll need the support and cooperation of many people. Let's begin with the members of the company team. The accounting department, the billing department, the shipping department, the service department, and perhaps the public relations department. Have you ever stopped to realize that you have two sets of customers? The obvious clients and prospects to whom you make presentations are your external customers those outside your organization. The second group includes the internal customers who work for your organization. Obviously you're not selling the same products and services to both groups, but you are selling. Just because the same person who signs your paycheck signs the paycheck for the receptionist doesn't mean that she or he is not your customer. The accountant, the shipping clerk, the administrative support team, and service managers are due and deserve the same courtesy, if not more, given to your prospects. Think about it. Would you treat a prospect the same way you treat the people in your own office? How can you use outstanding people skills outside your office and forget them when you walk through the doors of your building? When you fail to treat coworkers with the same courtesy and respect shown to customers, you will pay the price all unsuccessful salespeople pay for forgetting who your customers really are. So if a problem arises, work on fixing the problem, not placing the blame. Make sure the solution is agreeable to everyone involved. Check back a few days later to make sure things are still satisfactory. Taking the time to treat your internal customers with respect and a sense of urgency will help you to build a solid reputation inside your organization. This reputation will help you many times in your career as you call upon others to help out with an external customer. You know anybody can love the lovable. There's no talent involved in caring for the person who cares for you. A basic of success in life, as well as in sales, is learning to love the unlovable. And frankly, it's okay that you don't like everyone. You're not required to be best friends or to seek approval from every person in your organization. However, you will find that when you treat each person in your organization courteously and appropriately, you will be treated in kind. A primary method you can utilize to bring your support team together and be sure you're pulling on the same end of the rope as opposed to pulling against one another is to work toward shared ownership. When we share ownership in a project or a sale, Others buy into the ideas more enthusiastically and support whatever the project may be with their very best effort. Get everyone involved in the sales process and the chances of success will be greatly increased. Celebrate the successes as a team effort and see how your team will rally around you.
to apply this information today, think about the internal customers you have within your company. What is one thing you can do for someone this week to either show your appreciation or get them more involved in your sales efforts? For total success, apply all your best sales skills within the office as well as on the outside. I'm Zig Ziglar, and this is the final session with you as we're going to finish the sales process story. Coaching yourself to success. We have now covered many of the nuts and bolts of the sales process and how to become a successful salesperson. But there are some details I think are critical. You can acquire knowledge from books or CDs, the Internet, your coworkers, or seminars. You can grab hold of knowledge and put forth the effort to make it work for you. One of the things you need to do is keep a detailed record of your sales efforts. Research has solidly proven that those salespeople who keep copious records of their activity and the results of that activity are far more successful in their closing ratio than those who do not keep such good records. It just makes sense. You're in the best position to coach yourself to excellence. Like any good coach, you need to know the score. How many phone calls does it take to get an appointment? How many times do I ask for the order before I close the sale? What is my goal for the month? Broken down into daily quotas. If you can't quickly answer these questions, it will be hard for you to motivate yourself to make those phone calls. Set up your schedule. Keep the appointments and give the extra effort to make your goal for the day of the week. Coaching yourself to sales success involves knowing where you are and where you want to be and the plan for how to get there. It starts with being disciplined to keep up with the details of your activity. It is easy to confuse activity with accomplishment. I'm not suggesting that you need to work harder than you're already doing or work more hours than you already do. I am suggesting that you make sure that what you are doing during your work hours are activities that lead you to more sales. I also want to encourage you to be the best you can be. There is no one else on the earth, face of this earth that has the exact same thoughts, ideas, or personality as you. You're unique, a wonderful work of God. Use the ability you possess to apply the principles you have been learning, and sales success and professionalism are sure to be yours. A few additional thoughts I would like to share with you. Number one, you need to thoroughly understand that success is the result of knowing what you're doing, believing in what you're doing, and treating all of your prospects and customers with respect. Keeping all of your promises, becoming a constant student, learning and listening by following the right techniques and learning the new things that will make a difference in what you do in order for you to be the best that you can be. It must be a constant growth process. The way you handle today is important. Be a detail-oriented individual to the degree that you know exactly where you're going to be going. Set a schedule and work on that schedule to the very best of your ability. Yes, sometimes things do occur to make that difficult. But please remember, you are in business for yourself and many times by yourself. The most important attitude you can have is the attitude of understanding that you are in business for yourself and your success depends on your commitment your optimism, and your enthusiasm, your knowledge of what you're doing, your love for what you're doing. I believe the most important philosophy you can have is the clear understanding that you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. You need to also understand that success takes place in your mind and in your activities, not in what somebody else thinks or believes that you can or cannot do. You are in business for yourself. You're on your own. 
You are an entrepreneur. You are a winner. If you see yourself as a winner, if you believe in what you're doing, if you become a constant student so you can keep on finding new thoughts, new ideas, new prospects, and you are working with more people who know more things about the business than you do. You learn from your trainers, your employer, the people in the same industry. Follow through on the right principle with the right intent, and chances are pretty good that you will become a sales champion. Does this mean that you will always be up? No, it does not. But it does mean that you, will, you still are in charge of your own attitude. And if you work on an organized schedule, selling a product that you thoroughly believe in, understanding that the sales process really is something you do for the prospect and not for the prospect or to the prospect, and understanding that the sales profession is highly honorable, success will be yours. You must also clearly understand that most important thing you can do is to do everything with integrity. Build a reputation of that so that when somebody mentions your name, they will say, here is a man or a woman I can trust. I like to do business with him or her. Work hard. Be a constant student. Work on a schedule. Sell something you fervently believe in and clearly understand that the commission you make is minute compared to the benefits you have to offer to the person you are doing business with. That's right. You make a few bucks, perhaps, on each sale, but that customer can acquire a product, goods, or services that will enhance many areas of his life. Again, the sales process is something you do to love and believe in. Continue to study and grow. Serve your customers well, and they will reward you with a tremendous amount of financial success and a satisfaction that cannot be reached in many other professions in the same way.